I'm going to call this meeting of Gloucester uh, School Committee to order. I'll remind everybody that the mission of Gloucester Public Schools is for all students to be successful, engaged, lifelong learners. Uh, this meeting is recorded by video and audio in accordance with the open meeting law, um, consistent with the governor's orders, um, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law and banning gatherings of more than 10 people. This meeting will be conducted by remote participation. Um, if there's anybody here um, from the public, we are going to go into executive session uh, for the purpose of um, uh, pursuant of uh, Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 30A Section 21 for the following purpose, as an open meeting law may have detrimental effects on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body and to return to open session. Um, we will return to open a session um, uh, at the conclusion of the executive session or if we conclude before seven o'clock, we will um, recess until seven o'clock and uh, reopen uh, at seven o'clock, uh, at which time we will have, um, we'll, we'll go into the regular uh, agenda and have, um, and, uh, and, and re return into public session. So um, we will, um, we have, do we have a motion to go into executive session? So moved. Do you want me to read the whole purpose? I mean, you read the purpose. I, but I just read it. But you didn't state the um, groups, though. Oh, so. okay. You state the um, state the purposes. So we're going in for purpose three to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining with the following bargaining units: the Gloucester Teachers Association, the Gloucester Association of Educational Paraprofessionals, and also the nurses. And I so move. Second. Second. Uh, Maria, can we have a roll call vote? Kathy Clancy. Yes. Mr. Favaza. Yes. Chairman Pope. Yes. Ms. Prince. Yes. Mayor Taken. I don't see her. Uh, Ms. Watson. Yes. And Ms. Weaston. Yes. Okay, so we'll uh, um, adjourn the open session and go into um, the executive session. And as I said before, we will, we will come back at um, no earlier than uh, seven o'clock. If the executive session runs longer, um, it we may be delayed in coming back into um, public session. Okay, so it's seven o'clock. I'm going to call um, the uh, Gloucester School Committee back into um, public session. Um, we were in executive session. Um, uh, we concluded that we are, have rece recessed for the last. Uh, 10 or 12 minutes and now we're coming back into public session and I'm going to go through the, the normal opening um, procedures. Uh, so I'll remind everybody that the mission of Gloucester Public Schools is for all students to be successful, engaged, lifelong learners. And this meeting is recorded by video and audio in accordance with the open meeting law, consistent with the governor's orders, suspending certain provi provisions of the open meeting law. And, bar and banning uh, get gatherings of more than 10 people. The meeting will be conducted by remote participation. If you're calling in on a phone, you can press star nine to request to speak. If you are watching on a computer or a device, there is a raise hand button that you can tap or press to request to speak during oral communications. Um, so please use either of these. Um, uh, methods. Um, and uh, we have a quorum present and um, we will proceed um, with uh, the salute to the flag. And I'll ask you to join me in the salute to the flag. And after um, the salute to the flag, I would like um, uh, to um, have a moment of silence, um, remembering all the people who have died because of COVID-19. And that includes 40 people uh, that are Gloucester residents. Um, 16,456 Massachusetts residents and 528,000 uh, United States residents. So please give them some thought. I pledge allegiance to the flag 
of the United States of America and the two republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, oral communications. If there's anybody, uh, if the public shall have the opportunity at every regular school committee meeting to be heard under oral communications. Oral communications shall allow any resident who has a request or complaint of any nature relative to the school committee business to appear before the school committee, state their problem without debate and the matter will be referred to the proper subcommittee. For items that are on the agenda, members of the public may address the committee with the permission of the chair. Persons speaking under oral communications shall be limited to three minutes each and shall submit a copy of the prepared communication to the recording secretary. The school committee chair shall not allow complaints as to individual performance or character. Uh, that being said, um, is there anybody who'd like to um, speak under oral communications? Um, you will have to uh, raise your hand and um, I see Cynthia. Um, so please address uh, the school committee and um, state your name and, and uh, address. Hi, this is Cynthia Mahowski over at 13 Wall Street, um, Gloucester High High School English teacher. And um, I am, thank you so much for doing the moment of silence, actually. I really do appreciate that. Um, especially, I didn't realize that the number had gone up to 40 Gloucester residents that have um, passed because of COVID-19 and 16,000 Oh, more than 16,000 in Massachusetts, which brings me to why I'm on here tonight to invite the school committee to please contact the Jeff Riley and the Department of Education um, to cancel MCAS for this year. Because with 16,000 students across that, 16,000 people across the state, there are more than that, with um, all those families that have been affected, job loss, um, like scattered resources, very limited resources, the trauma, the motion, social emotional impact of, and putting our students through an unnecessary test is just, it, it's, a, it's obscene, it's ridiculous. And I think having a strong voice from our school committee saying that you, don't see it to be necessary or effective. I mean, and it's not just the 10th graders this year, but it's also going to be the 11th graders this year. Ninth graders who are new to the school who are taking an MCAS test just to, that doesn't count towards their graduation. But, um, or at least I don't think it does, it's biology. But just all of that, like, I, I don't think it takes a brain surgeon or a genius to know like, Students have been greatly impacted on this and adding another level of a high stress, high stakes test, an unnecessary time away from learning that so much has lost. And we're one of the few schools that thank you to all of, all of the administrators, to Superintendent Lummis, to James Cook, to all the principals across that have, my deans, Chris Cobbs, Robert Gallinelli, all of our, I mean, just everybody, Laura Carlson, everybody, how they've worked their butts off to keep us in. And we're one of the few places that have. And I think standing in solidarity with other school committees to tell Jeffrey Riley, who, by the way, continues to remote work hybrid. I mean, no, he works remotely. And both he and the governor are doing a hybrid model, um, model for their own workers. So they're not even going into work full time. And I think it's just, I think it's something looking at, I think um, 
to for Jeff Riley to um, because he is the commissioner to disregard um, the CDC guidelines and impact more of our safety and health. It's just it's cruel. It's unnecessary. And I think it's a huge voice. It's a strong impact using your collective voice to say something to Jeff Riley. And I invite you all to please seriously consider that. And I will be more than happy to help you draft the letter and or speak. You know, I like to. <laughs> we, we have drafted a letter. <gasps> oh my gosh, you just made my night. <laughs> we, it, it's already been sent. Um, it's Shut been up. Fine. It's um, in our packet tonight. Yeah, but but oh my I, god, I, I find it and, and sent it out. But we will be getting and we will be getting an update tonight. I I believe during the superintendent's report as to what is actually going on on the state level. Um, but I was um, I know that um, the federal um, people are uh, requesting that states do some sort of testing. So. Right. Uh, all of these things are in play, um, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get some more information, uh, but we have sent a letter already. So well, thank you, Cynthia. No, thank you. I appreciate that. And as you know, a collective voice and keep pushing because it only takes one grain of rice to tip the scales. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak under oral communications? Okay, seeing none, we'll, we will move on um, to our, um, uh, let's see, the comments of the chairperson. I just want to say um, that later on tonight, we're going to be talking about the eventuality of us um, going back into um, actual in-person meetings. Um, um, for instance, tonight we have um, uh, 56 um, attendees right now. I just would like to say that um, when we had in-person um, meetings, um, we never had 56 attendees. And I, so I would like, um, although we'll have a discussion about it later on, about what, how we might manage it, um, I would like to get public input as to how uh, um, the people who have been attending these meetings and I, it's um, find, um, the um, the ability to just um, sit on their couch and, and listen to it as opposed to getting in the car and, and driving somewhere and sitting in an auditorium um, to uh, listen to the school committee meetings. I'd like to I'd like some uh, input uh, from the community as to how they appreciate uh, whether they appreciate the the uh, Zoom meetings as opposed to in person meetings. Um, uh, that being said, um, we will move on to recognitions. Kathy. Um, I will do the honors of um, thanking all of our staff and administrators for keeping our kids learning and being there with them physically um, or being there frequently on their remote sessions for those that are remote only. We know it has taken a huge collective effort um, from the mayor uh, on down on the city side and of course from superintendent to to everybody within our district so we are grateful and grateful for the parents who are supporting their kids probably more than they ever dreamed or wanted to in terms of their learning um, this particular year. I want to follow that up by a recognition for a um, gentleman who used to work at Gloucester schools um, uh, John Madama is his name. He was a science teacher and he was a science coordinator at the middle school. Um, he, he was involved in many ways in terms of educating kids with his love of science. Um, he, so he passed away this past week and I just want to recognize him because um, he's the kind of scientist that would show up in his lab coat and, you know, do programs with the kids. And I, I happened to volunteer on a few occasions when he was running programs with elementary kids and he just really had a way with them um, and a way of communicating uh, his love for everything that has to do with science and, and nature, you know, taking kids on walks and places that you never even knew existed on Cape Ann. So um, I just want to acknowledge him. Laura. Um, in tonight's packet, we had um, minutes from August meetings where um, parents and other and teachers and others gave 
um, their feelings on reopening schools. And we had all sorts of emails that were sent to us. And it reminded me of how much this community has sort of spoken up and come together to make this year possible. And I really wanted to acknowledge that because going through those meetings um, from August and looking at where we are now, I and, and looking at all the emails that we received and the really thoughtful opinions, pro, against, with all sorts of concerns, all valid, all worthy. Um, I just, it brought me back to the decision-making that got us here. And I wanna thank everyone watching and the entire Gloucester community and especially the teachers and the nurses and all school staff and the administration and the parents uh, and families for getting us here. So thank you. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you. Um, I want to thank Kathy for recognizing John. I didn't know that he passed away and he was an incredible person. So um, I appreciate your words tonight. Um, it just brings back great memories of a incredible science teacher. Someone you want your student to have as a teacher in school, it's just awesome. But I just wanted to um, also recognize uh, the mayor who's not here right now. I, I know she's at another engagement tonight involving COVID and those who passed away. Um, but her, as we know, Safathi is a tremendous advocate and she has been on warp speed as President, former President Trump likes to say, um, trying to get vaccines in this community and um, keeping teachers in mind when she knows of open-ins for the different events that have come to Gloucester. So I just wanna recognize her for her efforts because I don't think her brain has shut off um, since the vaccines come out and she's trying to get everyone vaccinated as soon as possible. So I just wanna recognize her efforts and how, how lucky we are to have a mayor that um, is truly invested in keeping our community safe by getting the vaccines to everyone as quick as possible. Okay. Anyone else? I'd just like to um, recognize the, um, the uh, teachers and the staff and, and the students uh, at West Parish School who uh, last week entertained the governor and the commissioner of education and the director of education as well as the lieutenant governor and I think there are a whole bunch of other really important people there but there were so many of them I couldn't keep track but they did a fabulous job of representing Gloucester and and celebrating the fact that uh, they'd, we've been in um, public session for 101 days um, and uh, it was a very um, a very moving uh, day for a very day that made Gloucester very proud um, for all of the staff and the teachers and and um, the people and, and recognized by the um, by the state for for all the good work that's been done so um, thank you to them they were great hosts um, moving on Anything else, any other recognitions? Then we'll move on to uh, Megan, you're here by yourself tonight to our Student Advisory Council. Hi everyone, how are you guys? Good. <clears throat> All right, I'm gonna start off by talking about our GHS Health Center. Um, as of this week, there are 16 NHS students that have volunteered for the GHS Health Center to support the free food locker and the mission to collect all GHS students in the open door and food resources. Um, for the next couple of weeks, Open Door is offering local grocery store gift cards for every food locker referral that results in a visit to the Open Door to pick up the curbside groceries or meals. All GHS students and families that utilize the free food locker are eligible for this offer. Um, I'd just like to say that the people at the health center, they've been doing amazing work every day when you walk in the building, out of the building, there's people standing there asking if you need the lunch, if you need the meals, like they've just been so on top of it trying to reach every single student and it's truly, they've been doing an amazing job. Um, from the transition students, they're starting a retail training certification program with um, CVS. Um, once all the paperwork is cleared, it'll be an ongoing program with um, new students every semester. Um, the transition lead teacher, Jessica Bean and newly retired Nancy Goodman has been working on this to make it happen for all the students. Um, from the sophomore class, they're doing a shoe drive. They've collected 150 pairs of sneakers and cleats out of their goal of 700. Um, if you wanna donate um, sneakers, you can drop them off at the Mac at Gloucester, YMCA, Mark Adrian Shoes, or they'll be having a drive-in and drop-off at GHS on March 27th from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. From the GHS theater program, 
they have successfully begun rehearsing the hybrid uh, spring musical for high school musical. Um, students have learned three songs with the help of Mr. Flurry and his student teacher. They've also begun to record their vocal tracks at home with the help of the website we've been using called Band Lab. Um, and additionally, they have learned two dances from the student choreographer, Kaylee Allen, who's a class of 2021. And all the pictures and videos of their progress is on all their social media pages like Facebook, Instagram, stuff like that. Um, eighth grade move up day, we usually do an in-person move up day where um, the freshmen and the juniors will give them a tour. Um, because of COVID, we are uh, gonna turn this into a video. So we've been working on that the past couple of weeks, um, the student council members have. Um, and then our senior Martina Gallo is working on the editing for that video. We've done door decorating um, a couple times already, but we're doing it again. Um, it's underway right now. Students can either decorate for St. Patrick's Day or Women's History Month. Um, it just honestly, it brings some happiness to the hallways and it brings so much cheer and love uh, into the class. Um, NHS has spent some time at the Magnolia Library volunteering. Um, they've been doing an amazing job over there in the open door on March 13th. A lot of students will be going to get involved as well as tutoring is still going on. And then finally, to wrap it all up, um, I personally wanna give some recognitions to Mr. Cobbs and Mr. Gallinelli and especially our principal, Mr. Cook. Um, he's been doing an amazing job every morning when I come into school. He's out there, rain, shine, snow, sleet. He's out there saying good morning, welcoming all of us. And it's just, you know, it's just such a rough time right now. And to see him out there every morning, it's just, I, I love it. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Cook. Thank you, Megan. Um, any questions? Hmm? Seeing none, um, as always, you're, you're welcome to stay. Uh, but we understand if you if you've got uh, more important things to do. <laughs> Gotta go do that stats homework. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Are there any items on the consent agenda that anybody would like to remove uh, for further uh, discussion or explanation? I move that we approve the consent agenda. Second. Okay. Maria, could we have a roll call vote? Kathy Clancy. Yes. Chairman Pope. Yes. Ms. Prince. Yes. Ms. Watson. Yes. And Ms. Wieson. Yes. Okay, it carries unanimously. We'll move on to our next item, uh, which is our deliberations on educational issues. And I will uh, turn it over to uh, Superintendent Lummis uh, for an update on uh, where we're at. Thank you. Just had to find the mute button. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, great to see all of you. Um, got a number of updates tonight because uh, things continue to change here in the land of COVID. Uh, so we'll, we'll go over those. Um, let me give a few updates. I'm gonna actually share my screen here. Uh, one second. Almost there. Oh, wait. You can see a presentation? Good, I almost by accident hit the, hit the leave meeting button, which would have been a tragedy. Um, okay, so apparently, so our primary objective as everyone knows, and we've said this a million times, I've said this a million times this year, is safely educate as many students as possible in in-person school settings to maximize learning, address our students' full needs and support community and family needs. Well, it seems like the rest of the state is trying to catch up to Gloucester because apparently that is now their intention as well. But the snarkiness beside, we'll give an update on, on, the, on the DESE guidance that was changed as of yesterday, tonight. Um, before we get there though, I always wanna capture some of the great news. Um, uh, Chairman Pope did still some of my thunder here, but just before we go into things that may have to change and things that are challenging, I do want to take a moment to talk about some really great news. Obviously, the governor's visit and those other high-ranking officials were the, the, the lieutenant governor. You can see in this picture in the upper right, that's at the library at West Parish. That's the lieutenant governor and the governor. Um, they had a great um, roundtable discussion. Without the roundtable, 
with uh, a few teachers, a few parents, um, uh, myself, and uh, just was, they were great with their questions. Um, uh, Sally Bertolino and Christy Stropel um, and uh, were two of the parents. Um, uh, I'm gonna forget the names of the teachers. I'm so sorry, um, but that's just a limitation of my brain right now. But really helpful in, in, in telling both the Secretary of Education, the Commissioner, the Governor, the, the Lieutenant Governor, Senator Bruce Tarr, and others, just both how difficult and challenging it's been, but also um, how fantastic it's been to have their students in, um, whether it's their children or their students in school every day. And it just, they represented, as Chairman Pope said, all of our schools so incredibly well. Um, and that was just a great, great visit that uh, West, West Parish did for all of us. Um, some other good news that's really happening where you know, we continue to try to support the social, emotional, mental health of our um, students, of our, of our colleagues, of our families. As I say again and again, you know, the single most important thing we did to support social, emotional, and mental health was to have our kids in school four and five days a week, creating uh, you know, that interaction with their peers and their friends, um, uh, I heard today a parent talk about how her, uh, this is not, not from this community, lives in a different community, how her high school uh, daughter hasn't seen in person many of her friends for a year now. And uh, that is tragic. And, um, and thankfully, uh, because we've been doing such a great job here in Gloucester, um, our kids have not been disconnected in that way nearly as much. Um, Still challenges though, and we, we always wanna pay attention to them. And the Gloucester Education Foundation and our PTO uh, leaders have organized some uh, forums recently to help parents and support parents. That's a, our Safe Social Media Family Forum, which was last month, just yesterday. Um, and that's the graphic here on the left is about the GEF forums that are happening that they're doing with parents and with um, staff members of ours. Last night, it was a parenting during, uh, during a pandemic uh, interactive forum for elementary families. Um, our West Parish um, Adjustment Counselor, Lisa Labella was there. Uh, Lisa was fantastic in, in, in providing insight and assuring, reassuring parents. Dr. Brian Orr was there as well. Um, and then next week on the, on the 16th will be the same type of a uh, forum, but for middle and high school parents and families. Um, there was just a lot of time for questions and answers and some excellent uh, you know, uh, partners and also our staff um, answering questions for folks. All forms, we're recording all of them and they, they can be rewatched at any time. Another area that GEF is helping and we're working with GEF and GEF is really helping us out on is supporting staff. Uh, we're reaching out now and we'll hold some focus groups to learn from staff um, how what GEF can do um, and, and work with us on to support, um, to provide opportunities to support social, emotional, mental health for staff. Um, those could be little things like um, you know, a nice lunch, but those also could be more significant things. Um, but we're going to ask staff and learn from staff about what will be helpful to them um, as we uh, move towards the rest of the school year. So just great stuff, partnerships and community efforts, uh, working to help our families and also our staff. Um, a few other updates, um, staff vaccinations. So just a, a headline for folks to look more into. The governor announced today that there will be four um, days at mass at the Massachusetts vac vaccination sites and the, and likely the regional ones that are dedicated to teachers. Those are in late March and early April, beginning of April. Um, a lot more to come on that as the state figures that out. I do not have many details on that, but just want to make sure folks are aware of that. We continue to work with the Department of Health here to see if we can get a local um, uh, you know, st uh, school staff um, vaccination clinic up and running. Uh, we are hope we are working on that. We are hopeful, as everyone knows, there's a real issue with supply of the vaccine in the state. So we're not sure if that can happen. That certainly would be, I, I think, would be easier and better for our our, our staff. Um, but folks really, um, you know, um, need to uh, do what's best for them at this point. Um, uh, and, but we'll, if we find any more developments on, on that, we will make sure people know about it. I inform staff that we're working on that over the weekend. Um, no further updates now. Singing and band lessons are, uh, you heard um, from Megan that um, we are now uh, starting to sing at, at the high school again. And that's all in preparation for the high, sc high school musical, will be, which will be a, a version of an online production. 
Um, and we're taking and have checked with uh, Karen Carroll about all the precautions on that, 10 feet of distance, firmly masked, that sort of thing, limited time. Um, but we're doing that in, um, in uh, alignment with both Department of Health guidance here and also the state guidance as well. I also wanna just bring up one important issue that we're beginning to work on. And, um, and, and I wanna just reiterate, uh, communicate to families, but we'll continue to communicate that of course, in the springtime in schools, we have a lot of rituals, traditions and rites of passage, sort of all in many, many grade levels. And um, you know that can be from proms to graduations and moving up ceremonies, um, uh, you know, uh, picnics, things like that. Uh, I do want to say a couple of things. Uh, as we have been all year, our staff, our principals, our school leaders will be very thoughtful about this. They'll be, um, you know, uh, working with a lot of others to figure out the best way to do do these types of things. Um, we'll really, I think, dig in on what's most important to preserve, uh, given that we will have limitations all through the spring on what we can do in these important areas. Um, I do want folks to realize that, you know. Things won't be just the way they have been in prior years and any of these, um, but we are, we will work and are working to make sure that they're safe, um, that uh, as many people can, as you know, can as participate, we can do as many of them as possible. Um, but please understand that we will be thoughtful about that. We will be, um, we'll be communicative. We'll keep people in the loop um, and, and try to do the best you possibly can. Um, but please realize that they probably won't look just like um, uh, what they have in the past. Um, whether it's the, the, one of the first examples of this will be the um, National Honor Society induction, which I believe is on March 25th. Um, and again, really wanting to honor both the folks from last year and this year, um, but there will be differences um, in terms of things like spacing, things like um, you know, how uh, sashes are handed off to, to different, to, to, you know, from one class to the next. Um, but at the same time, it will be a, a, um, an, a uh, it'll be, a powerful and um, important moment for those students, just like our other rituals and traditions will be as we go along. So just wanna give folks just a sort of a, a, um, a headline on that and sort of a look forward. Um, oops, going the wrong way. So other updates we'll give tonight are COVID updates. Um, as we have already done number one, we'll give you a COVID update as we always do. We'll give you a um, update, um, what we're beginning to do and the way we're thinking about and some of the challenges we're facing on the updated guidelines that were released just yesterday. And then uh, we'll have a career vocational and technical education update from Principal Cook. So as we always do, we like to look at how we're progressing here. Uh, two weeks ago, the city was at 64 active cases. And if you remember what I said then, that for those two weeks prior, they were averaging about 60 cases. It wasn't going up or down from that very much and sort of steady you know, at 60, give or, give or take five. Um, two weeks later, we've, we're now in sort of in the 40s typically. Um, you know, changes day to day across the city, but typically for the last uh, almost week, we've been in the 40s, right around the 40s. So um, we're not, you know, uh, at the bottom hasn't dropped out. We're not down to, you know, a dozen or something like that, but um, we certainly aren't growing and we're sort of in this steady state and um, by all indicators, folks keep it saying that that will hopefully continue to decline bit by bit as we keep going. In our schools, we have had 144 cases um, of student, between students and staff since the beginning of the year. 132 of those have been resolved. Uh, 12 are active right now. And that's from a, just a bump up over the last couple of days. We are down to uh, six and eight uh, last week, that sort of stuff. A few more cases just recently. Some will probably fall off tomorrow. Um, only two of the recent cases, um, this, pat this, this current week and going into, la into last week have had close contacts. Um, and as we see, transmission is typically coming, continues to, to happen related to family events. That's something we've known for, for months now. It continues to happen. Families still need to be cautious. Uh, just because someone's in your family doesn't, and they love you, doesn't mean they can't give you COVID. So please, we continue to urge you to take precaution, distance, mask, uh, if anyone's sick in a family, keep them away from other folks, that sort of thing. So as we always do, I give you um, the, where things stand in the schools today. So on the right-hand side is today, on the left-hand side is two weeks ago, the last school committee meeting. You can see essentially, what's interesting here is, is, is steady state in terms of the total cases, 11 to 12. But if you, as you can see, this sort of flattened out across schools a little bit more. Fewer at GHS, more a couple other places, but still overall, um, very low across the board 
in any individual school. That's good news. Um, so I want to give you an update on the weekly COVID testing that's happening at O'Malley and GHS. This, continue, this go, is going very, very well, um, except for one major issue, which I'll talk about, that we need to remedy, and we need a lot of help remedying. So this week, all the students and staff that were tested at the high school, that's 163 people, all tested negative. In fact, over 415 tests over three weeks, um, all those groups have been negative at the high school, haven't had a single positive result in all the weekly COVID testing at the high school. However, the disappointing part that I really, really want our community to work on and fix um, is that only 20% of staff and students are participating. Um, we have a target of hopefully 70%, um, and this is not, not good enough, honestly. Um, we've communicated with folks. We continue to try to outreach. We are now um, enlisting students to help us with some outreach and create a video, but we do need to do more, and the high school community needs to do more to get each other um, uh, signed up for this. Um, at O'Malley, similar story, um, uh, 163 people, that is not true. Um, it's 100, I think 44 people were tested at O'Malley um, over the uh, past couple of days. Um, Pat, yesterday, I'm sorry, yesterday, uh, all groups were negative this week. Uh, that is a decline, sorry. Uh, we have fewer people testing at O'Malley this week than last week by about uh, 20 actually. Uh, there have been 482 tests at O'Malley over the last three weeks. Only one, there's only one group that was positive, only one person that was identified as positive over all those tests. So uh, that was last week. Uh, we communicated with the O'Malley community about that. Sorry. And um, that, uh, that just was just showing us. So what happened was one group was positive. The next day, first thing, the members of that group, seven people came in, were tested with a rapid test. We found one positive. That was, uh, although you don't like to get positives, that's just the way the testing should work. And it worked like a charm. And that was great. And we, that, that, that's, that, um, that individual um, could then, their, their family was informed. Um, the individual was asymptomatic, so no one knew that uh, that person what, what could have been positive. So we helped that family and helped the school by identifying that positive. Again, at O'Malley though, still we need, want to get more folks participating. 27% is better than the high school, but still it's not where we want to be and we're not where we need to be. Um, our target is 70%. Um, really all staff and students at these two schools should participate. It is free weekly testing. I, I did it myself. Um, I was, I'm signed up at, at the high school to do it. I was there to, to witness the pool, the testing uh, yesterday. Um, I did it myself. I did it wrong the first time. The very nice folks in Beauport uh, were explained how I did it wrong. I did it again. Um, but it's a gentle swab that you do yourself in, in, in both nostrils. Um, it's not painful. It's free. We really, really need folks to uh, get with the program and help, and help out the whole community by signing up for this. Uh, we will continue to communicate and are open to more ideas about how to do it, do it better. But we are enlisting students at both O'Malley and um, GHS to help out with communication. So uh, any questions there? Let me pause there. And then... Um, I will, uh, John, I'm not sure if you can see folks there. Let me, yeah, let me I can see, uh, Kathy's got her hand up. Um, ben, I was wondering how many of the staff are participating? Are they around the same percent as students? Um, or do we know that? Yeah, it's a good question. We don't actually know exactly because the, the Project Beacon can't give us those numbers of, you know, can't, how do you say this, disaggregate it that way for us. So, and because there's, you know, different teams across the, each school testing and we, and, we, and we combine staff and students into the same groups, um, we just don't, we just haven't been able, been able to get that, those exact numbers yet, um, which is disappointing to me. I'd like to have those numbers, honestly, but, but we do, I, I would say it's probably comparable. We do know, uh, we no, do know for sure that, um, I mean, there are more students and staff. Um, it isn't, for example, that there's, 100, you know, all staff and just some students. Um, because, and we, we know that because of just the, you know, each group as we do it, you know, there's a, a, a one staff member and multiple um, students, that sort of thing. Uh, okay. Samantha? I'm just wondering, and this is a question, I guess, for, for everybody. Does anybody have a sense of why people are not signing up? Is there any misinformation out there that needs to be clarified? Is it time consuming? 
Does anyone have a sense of why people would be hesitant? Uh, initially, the, the term pool is confusing people. We know that. Um, there has been some current concern we've heard. Um, folks uh, worried that it might be painful. Um, other and, and we've tried to address that, um, you know, by showing a video and stuff like that, and 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 sharing information. Um, another concern was uh, it would force people to quarantine. That isn't was never the case, and it certainly isn't the case in practice. Um, and because even if you are in a positive group, uh, you don't quarantine. You have a, a retest very quickly, and then only if you're positive do you quarantine, or if you're in close contact with someone who's positive. So we tried to address those. The ones we are aware of. Um, another thing, very honestly, is is um, someone asked me recently, um, you know, who's gotten many emails about it, uh, didn't know that um, we had a, you know, on GPS back to uh, you know, GPS back together. I mean, back to the GPS or our website that they didn't, they weren't aware there's a whole section uh, all about it, including FAQ. So what, that just it, it's it's people don't always. Um, read everything that's sent to them. They're busy, they've got busy lives. Uh, I send a, uh, an email that isn't all that straightforward. You know, this is complicated stuff. And um, so it's, it's not everyone is, is uh, you know, reading the information and, and learning about it. So, uh, but that's, that's always been the tough one to break through no matter what, so. Okay. But other, other folks here may have other, other you know, you, you, I lo I'd love to hear if you're aware of concerns people have. La Laura? Well, just, on that, um, I'd love to know how we can help, you know, how we can help promote this more, um, how we can, you know, how we, the school committee, we parents, all of us, how we can help um, get the word out more more directly. Yeah, I, I think my immediate answer is talk to people. This is, I mean, this is viral, right? So you know, it's part of the pun, but you know, this is viral messaging. This is telling people, you know, friends and social media, um, make sure, you know, if your child is doing it, make sure, um, you know, uh, that, um, uh, that you tell folks how it's going. Teachers can certainly use their own social media accounts and share with their students and their, and their fa uh, families that they're doing it um, and can reach out individually. Um, so it's actually more people being messengers. Myself, Principal Cook, Principal Beatty, being only messengers, we'll, we'll, we'll never get it done. So we need more messengers. Um, if you folks want to come in and get tested and uh, and put things up on social media with pictures of, of, the, of, of the six or seven of you doing it. I'm sure we can probably figure that out. That would, I don't think would break too many protocols, but um, you know, so it's gotta be a group effort and the more messengers we have, I think the better off we are. I, um, I'd just like to add um, something about the, uh, the re trying to get a regional testing site. Uh, I did have a conversation with Senator Tarr um, uh, earlier this week, and um, the mayor was on that uh, call too. She may add to this, but he's actively involved in trying to get a regional testing site um, for, um, it would include Manchester, Essex, uh, Gloucester, Rockport, and Ipswich. Um, so, and if they can accomplish that, that would make uh, testing, uh, not testing, um, vaccination, excuse me, site. Um, that would make vaccinating teachers if we had a regional site that it would uh, much easier. So uh, he's aware of it and he, and he is uh, working on it. I just wanted to add that. Great. All right. Uh, Moving on. Moving on. Let me share my screen again. Okay. So, um, Want to give folks an update on what the Department of Education um, has said or has, has laid out to districts and the state. We'll talk a little about um, communication outreach with families, our challenges, we see them right now and there are next steps. Um, I've included what I sent to staff yesterday. Um, within about an hour uh, or so of the new guidance coming out, I wrote to the staff uh, an email and, and the, 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 the purpose of that email was just to take people's temperature down. You know, whether it's staff or principals, uh, a superintendent or families, um, people are reading and hearing about um, the changes that the commissioner is expecting, and um, you know they're they're appropriately um, or you know reasonably um, you know concerned. What does it mean for us? You know, and, and whatever whatever role there are. And so I wanted, as this says here, you know I want to reassure everyone, the school committee, families, staff, that you know we have 
if nothing else, all of us, I don't mean me, I mean all of us, our principals, our staff, our colleagues, our families, the school committee, have been very thoughtful and deliberate in figuring out what to do and how to do it this year. We're gonna continue that pattern. We're gonna continue in that way to decipher and understand what this means for us now as well, okay? We're not all of a sudden gonna become knee-jerk reactions. We're not all of a sudden gonna be, you know, um, just you know, fly off the handle. We're gonna be thoughtful, deliberate, and we'll figure out the best ways to do this. We're gonna make good choices that help our school community move forward, um, you know? And, uh, but we gotta sort that out. And so that's beginning, that's working on. I'm gonna give you some updates on that here. Uh, so in terms of just what Desi has said, this is obviously a summary of many pages, but the, you know, there, isn't too, there aren't too many changes, very honestly, but there's some key ones. Um, definitely the requirement is to move towards full-time in-person learning, okay? Uh, we weren't clear uh, until this came out, whether because he was also saying, you know, five days a week, okay? We weren't sure if that meant five days a week the way we're doing it or something else, okay? And he said definitely full-time in-person learning five days a week. That's an average of five hours of structured learning time each day, K to five, okay? And that means in a typical six hour day, you, 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 that's what you typically have is five hours of structured learning because you have lunch, recess, um, you know, breaks, passing, that sort of thing. So that's a typical school day. And for um, high school, I'm mean, sorry, uh, secondary, so six through 12, 5.5 hours of structured learning time each day. That's also pretty typical for, um, uh, for in, in a regular school year, regular school day, that's what we would have. Um, the third bullet's very important. All structured learning time hours are required to be delivered in person five days per week. Okay, so they are really pushing very hard to uh, end high, to, to really um, get folks in person and to stop hybrid models. Essentially, in fact, hybrid uh, remote learning that is in a hybrid model will not be um, counted towards structured learning time going forward. Uh, the other, it's not a change, you know, uh, but three feet distancing at this point is expected. Um, whereas before it was really allowed and recommended, um, they essentially all do allow for waivers on, on some of this, but they will not allow for waivers on if you're not at three feet. They, you can't say, for example, um, we're at five feet and therefore you know, we, we can't do X, Y, or Z. Um, you've got to be at three feet and then perhaps ask for waivers uh, for different, different reasons. Um, so they're really pushing hard. The three feet distance is, is, is what needs to be used. Um, importantly, especially for us, and we'll talk about this in a moment, the, the guidance on distancing during meals has not changed. It's still six feet anytime folks are eating uh, or any other time individuals do not wear face coverings, okay? That's, um, that's significant for us, very significant. And it's gonna be uh, very complicated to overcome, but we'll talk about that. Um, Distancing requirements on buses are eliminated. We, I mentioned that two weeks ago. I'll give you an update on where we are on that. Other safety protocols do remain in place. COVID safety um, you know, protocols, hand hygiene, cleaning face coverings. Interesting enough, which is sort of a surprise to me, they are very, saying very, very clearly now that all uh, students, no matter what age, have to wear face coverings. And that's, I guess, news to somebody. Of course, based on your decision in August, we've been doing that for whatever, six, seven, eight months now. Uh, but some places, I guess, haven't been, which is surprising to me. Um, and then also in the guidance, they expect family outreach um, as expected, including surveys as we consider or introduce new changes. And I'll talk about that too. So um, let me just keep going on a few of these things. So just in terms of time frame, the, any changes in terms of full-time in-person school five days per week for uh, should be implemented by April 5th for elementary, for K to five, sorry, by April 28th for six to eight. Uh, and to, to be announced in April though, for grades nine through 12. Um, some folks are thinking that should be May. Uh, the commissioner today said April, um, but that is still a TBA, a TB determined for, to be determined for high school. Um, we'll talk more about that in a bit. Um, and some the guidance may change as we go along as the commissioner said today. So, but that's the basic time frame. Some of the challenges we face in going full day every day. So one thing that's very, very important is some of the major challenges that we faced and could not fully address in the fall or summer and then into fall have not been changed, okay? Um, we still have lunch and breakfast um, challenges and we still have to figure out uh, how that is possible at six feet. We could not figure that out 
in, in, the, in the summer and fall. If we had, it's likely we could have been having full days all year, um, especially in K to five and perhaps in six to eight. So we have to work on that again. Uh, that's a challenge for lots of reasons. Space, where do you put the kids? Because um, remember, and unlike many schools in the Commonwealth, our gym in, in, our, in four of our elementary schools, our gym and cafeteria are the same exact space. Often you, um, they're smaller. Um, uh, furniture is a challenge, meaning um, uh, the furniture, the best way to do is to have individual desks of people that sit at that are six feet apart. Um, when you have tables, uh, you are limited in your flexibility about how, where to put people. Um, and then supervision. If we spread people into other in, into additional rooms, that requires more staff to supervise folks. It's very difficult to have uh, teachers supervise lunch because that's when their lunch time is typically. So um, that so those are the challenges that we uh, need to work on or begin to work on. Uh, space we're already looking at tents, uh, especially at the elementary schools. Uh, also, how to repurpose you know space we're, we're using now and change them up again. Uh, furniture we'll be taking a visit to St. Anne's to see what we stored there and how that can be redeployed. Um, Desks are a real challenge. Uh, um, I mean, I'll get to that in a moment. Um, and the supervision, uh, I am making an official all call to, to staff, I mean, to community members, parents, family members, anybody you know. We are going to likely need more staff, more temporary staff for supervision. We, we can hire more new supervisors. Uh, we can hire people. We are not looking for volunteers. Um, we can't really re rely on volunteers to staff lunch because if they don't show up, you're in trouble but we will be needing and really would help and people should look out for us to advertise for more supervision for uh, lunch blocks um, all throughout the system. Um, so those are three, three challenges for meals. Um, the distance obviously is a, is a major challenge there. Moving on to the three feet, three feet distance does not resolve all of our space challenges. We have plenty of rooms where if you're at three feet distance, you can't fit all the kids uh, into that classroom if it was fully enrolled and, 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 and fully uh, attended. Um, this also gives us real furniture and physical space challenges because um, uh, we don't have more desks at this point if we need more desks, but if we bring tables back, um, kids need, they don't fit enough tables in a room and also tables um, uh, where kids are not three feet apart are useless. So. Um, I can't, you know, so just to give you a sense of, it's hard to capture actually, literally the, we can't at this point order new furniture, it won't come in until June or later. Um, so there are just real challenges at this point about how to um, uh, get more students in some classrooms uh, because of furniture limitations or lack of lack of flexibility. And in some places we may hit, um, hit a wall where you can't literally physically put in any more students into a classroom that, um, that uh, is that already at three feet. Um, so that's not easy to deal with. Schedules, um, this will likely mean reworking many schedules. Talking to principals today, I tried to get them to not go full all change, but where can they make some simpler changes that allow them to extend, extend the day to a full day. Um, uh, Middle, middle school and, and the high school are extremely complicated as, we, as we've described before. I think it was Mr. Favaza asked earlier in maybe December, could we do this? And I was very clear then, um, you know, that is not something simple to do. It wasn't then, it's even more complicated now, um, especially because you not only add where people are in the school year, March is the most exhausting month, but also we're at the same time trying to get up and, 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 and put in place many of the traditions, rituals, and rites of passage we already talked about. And now those take a tremendous amount of planning. So to rework schedules right now will not be easy. Um, we are likely to face new start and end times. If you go to a full day, um, we start having transportation problems because um, the, uh, the times, the start and end times are, you know, uh, piled on top of each other. So that new start and end times leads to re redoing all the bus routes. Um, and I mentioned the high school already. So again, I'm not saying these to say we can't do this. I'm saying this to make sure folks understand the complexity we're facing. If we had been remote fully until now, um, it's a whole different ball of wax. Um, even if we've been sort of, you know, a different sort of hybrid, it might be different. Um, but this is not an easy thing. Uh, we're in the beginning stages of it. 
uh, we'll continue to reach out to you, families. Um, let me just, um, I want to make, want to make one, so we're also concerned about, aware of a fam, concerns families may have. One primary one, which we've been already reaching out to remote learning academy folks, is that, um, and this is a quote from the DESE guidance, families still have the choice to have their children learn remotely through the end of the school year, okay? We, of course, hope folks come in and come into the schools. It's, it's as safe as, as, as it has been all year and perhaps even safer as, as, the, as the year continues with more vaccinations. Um, I wanna be clear with the elementary remote learning academy, we do not expect any changes, okay? We're not gonna minimize that. We're not gonna eliminate staffing because um, I'm sure we'll need it. Um, we're not, I mean, we're not gonna like, change people's teachers or their, their classroom configurations. We expect that to go as it has been. Um, Mailey Remote, um, the Mailey Remote Academy will likely see, will, will very, may possibly see some changes um, as more students return to a Mailey um, and the schedule's redone. We may have to adjust some of the staffing or sort of the, the class configurations in the Remote Academy. We wouldn't expect the quality or the, or the learning to change, but we may have to move students around some. Not to take them out if they wanna stay, but just to perhaps reorder their classes um, or maybe shift some teachers around. Um, that's still very much a work in progress. Just want to give people a, a heads up on that. And the Remote Academy, uh, Principal Cook doesn't expect any changes at this point. And where they are in their term, they cannot make any changes in the Remote Academy um, for the high school. I mean, and these are the folks who are, that are full-time remote that have not come into the school buildings is what I'm talking about now, just, just those groups. Um, let me pause there. Um, actually, let me give you just if you can bear with me for a couple more slides. So we also have to reach out to uh, families and communicate with them. I'll give an update to families along the same lines I'm, as, I, as I'm giving you right now tomorrow via email. Um, we, we will need to survey families. Uh, I'm not sure on what yet, but we'll work on that in terms of getting a sense of will there be changes? Will, will any families, for example, um, not want to stay in if we're at, if we're at three feet all around? As you know, we've been three feet. Every school has had some version of three feet. It might be in a class or two, or it might be many classes. Um, but every school at this point has, is somewhere near three feet, at least in one class. Um, actually, except, except for Plum Cove. Plum Cove is the only school at this point that isn't at three feet, at least in a class. M many of our elementary, elementary classes are not at three feet at this point, um, and they may not go to three feet. You know, um, they they will. We will go to whatever space is needed at three feet or above, depending on the enrollment in a specific class. I should say that. We don't automatically just go to three feet. Transportation, we launched a survey on Tuesday. We have actually two surveys out, one to those families who are already taking the bus to see if they are okay with the changes that we'll make. We are, I'm expecting that we will go to two, two students per bench seat at a maximum. That'll, that essentially doubles our capacity on our buses. We may not need that. Um, but, and then also we're, sur so we're serving families to see if they would want their students removed if we do that. We're also serving families that are not taking the bus to see if they want to take the bus. Um, so far, uh, just out a couple days, these are the folks who responded through the survey. Other folks have responded through email. Um, so far, 47 students want to be added across the whole district. Um, 31 of those students live under two miles. Uh, 16 obviously live two miles or more. Uh, 16 for, are from the veteran school. Uh, we may have the ability to add, add a bus to, to veterans, um, uh, but that's something that we're, we're trying to gauge if it would be needed. Um, and if we could do it, then we will we'll, we'll try to. Not a done deal yet, but something we're, we're getting information in order to figure that out. Um, and the last piece is just um, some next steps. So we'll continue, continue, to, continue to communicate with the families. Our principals and leadership teams will continue to address and work on the complexities. Um, they'll be working you know, with their teams uh, at the schools, um, consulting with them, working through things, answering questions, you know, just day by day, trying to figure things out. Um, it'll be different at different schools at different levels. Uh, we're working to identify tents, furniture, staff, supplies, other materials that may be needed dividers, things like that. We're working on creating entirely new bus routes, entirely new schedules where they're needed. As I mentioned, we'll survey families. We really want to get more students staff participating, participating pool testing. Um, if we have more students in the building, that'll help even more. 
at O'Malley and GHS. And then of course, we'll continue to provide updates to the community and the school committee. Um, and we're shooting for any changes uh, at the elementary school to be April 5th. It is also possible that we may also um, uh, work with the Desi, with Desi on, um, on waivers. We could also do that, which would make give us some more time to figure out our, our spacing for lunch and other things. So that's in the cards, but we don't know that yet. I'll make sure the school committee is aware of that. Um, let me stop the share and answer any questions you might have. Joel? Thanks. Um, and, and just to say at the beginning, I, I do not envy the position that puts the administration in, and I wish, wish you all the, the best of luck in working through this. Um, my question is about the waivers, <clears throat> and I'm sorry if you explained this and I, I just misheard it. But the waivers that become available, is that a waiver from complying with the new directive as in going in full time, or is it a waiver from further, like, is there a hard line on this spacing? Could you go, oh, we can't fit students at six feet in cafeterias, we can only do four feet at the high school. Is there a waiver for that? Or is that a hard line? And we'd have to instead get a waiver for going full day because we can't provide lunch. That, those are all good questions. And those are all the questions that honestly we all have. So I'll, I'll talk about waivers, just to say this. One that's clear that we can't, no one can get a waiver for is if you're a high incident uh, community, high incident of COVID. Okay, they're saying that doesn't that doesn't qualify. Okay, for operational logistical challenges, which is, sort of is what you're asking about, that's where waivers are possible. Uh, at the same time, they say if you're if you're requesting one of those, they're going to bring out a team to look at everything and give you more ideas about how, how you can do it. So I think they're going to be pretty. Uh, uh, they won't be very generous with waivers, is my is my uh, is my take, um, and. I don't think it'll be um, waivers on you don't need to go full day. Um, if that's the case, it would be a temporary thing. They're very clear that any waivers they give are most likely to be temporary. Um, so I mean giving more time to solve an operational or logistical challenge um, or get more furniture so we can do that, that sort of thing. But the type of questions you're asking, Joel, are just the type of questions superintendents and, and, and others have um, for Desi, honestly. But you suspect some of the waivers will go in the other direction where they'll, they'll send a team out and go, okay, fine, you can't fit them six feet apart in the cafeteria, we'll let you go to four? I mean. I, I, I don't yeah. think that 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 four, I mean, the only- Unless they get more tents. Yeah, yeah, I think, yes, I think that's what they're gonna do. You know, okay. or, or get more people, that sort of thing. I, I don't think, especially on that one, they, they use, strict distancing like that that's the term they use on on unmasked with strict six foot i'm sorry distancing um is the term and that's that's one of the few times i've seen them use that word strict on any of these guidelines i could imagine people in the community be you know although i think there'll be some cautious um you know, potential excitement about this i think those would be kind of things that would be scary for some people if they thought oh well if you can't fit them far enough apart you'll get a waiver and you just you know jam all at the same table like you used to, I imagine that would be, you know, um, uh, a concern for a lot of our, our school families. So, yeah. although again, I do not envy the hoops of the jump through to get these boxes checked. If, you know, even in a world of waivers, these distancing ones seem to be, you know, unlikely to be the waiver um, given that probably brings comfort to some people who are nervous. Yeah, I, I think it's, it, it it's going to be very, very challenging, you know, and, and, and I, you know, we all have to acknowledge that, that, you know, and this is one of the reasons we got to families is, you know, some folks may not be entirely comfortable with, you know, a, a full school going, you know, and, and so we need to know that, you know, um, not sure we can do what we can do about it yet, because we haven't gotten there, but, but, you know, we understand that, that some folks may be anxious about this, you know, and just like folks were in the springtime, and, and, and I mean, sorry, the summer, the summer, and, you know, we got to help them, help them with that, and, you know, make sure we're doing things, um, uh, that that respects that. Samantha? That was my exact question, but I have an additional question. Um, is there increased funding associated with some of these new suggestions? No, yes, I mean, not directly with these new suggestions, but 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 there is the federal dollars from um, you know COVID relief and, and ESSER two, which we have access to. So, you know, 
we have to be very cautious of how we use that money now because it really will affect what, I mean, because those monies are all available through next year and even beyond and are expected to be used through next year and beyond, you know? So if we're not um, thoughtful and deliberate and, and cautious, really cautious now, uh, we could really uh, harm or hamper ourselves for the next, not only year, but two years. So um, while their funding isn't, isn't necessarily an issue, um, uh, we have to be cautious um, and thoughtful about it. But I think the other piece is more likely is, uh, you know, like we could use more furniture, but how we, we won't be able to get it, you know, that sort of thing. That's probably a, a larger issue than funding at this point. Laura. Thank you. So as I look at the calendar, if we were able to start this on April 5th, at the elementary schools, that's 10 weeks of school left, right? Or maybe a little bit less, depending on the last day of school. Um, and then, you know, obviously for the middle school and the high school, we're going into eight weeks and less. Um, do you think, I mean, it, it's an enormous amount of work um, given what we've done this year. Um, and just, and I just sort of want to get your feedback on this. And of course, we're not out of this pandemic, right? Things are better, but um, is, are these, so I guess my first question is, are these recommendations being done in any way with the Department of Public Health? Like who's, you know, we have a, my understanding from federal public health officials is that we're at this very precarious moment right now. Um, and so here's our state saying, okay, everybody back, right? Um, but as you said, if we're a high risk community that changes, if, if our numbers change, how does it change? So I'm, I'm, it just feels like there's a lot of variables here and I'm wondering. Yes, yeah, so it's a great question. And I skipped over a bunch of what the commissioner has been saying. I'm um, just, just for time really, but, but I want to say, I want to be clear. I want to, I want to just restate something. If you're a community of high prevalence, you don't get exceptions. Whereas before you might have, so he's saying that, you know, and, and that, you know, even in, in high prevalence communities, like you may be red, say for example, although that, um, you, that doesn't allow you, uh, qualify you for a waiver. Okay, does that make sense? I, mean, um, I'm not I saying understand what you're concerned. saying. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so in terms of um, what, so um, a, a few, uh, there is some new news, so to speak, um, that the commissioner shared with us, um, which is public. I mean, um, uh, I think it's, a, a, it might be as many as 300 or many, many pediatricians and infectious disease experts, local ones in the state of Massachusetts are, are very clear now um, that um, two things I, I understand, and I'll share this letter with you, it's public, uh, it's out there now, but um, that three feet of distancing is, uh, is, is really, really okay in terms, of what, in terms of what's been shown and what's been learned, okay? Um, and so that's their opinion, first of all, from what they've seen um, and that, um, it's very, very, and, and where we are now, it's they are urging strongly and 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 believe. I'm I'm paraphrasing obviously that uh, schools need to be in person, okay, and that is the best and safest thing for our our students, for students, young people, and communities. Okay, that's one piece that he shared with us. The other piece is a study that's been done um, uh, in Massachusetts about three feet versus six feet, and I actually was gonna show it to folks, I, 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 maybe I can pull it up if I have it handy someplace, um, that um, shows um, that the uh, rate of transmission three feet versus six feet in schools is not, is not different. It's essentially overlapping, okay? And, so, and that's gonna be published in a peer reviewed journal sometime maybe this week, uh, um, a very highly regarded one, I don't know which one, it's just, I'm just sharing what the commissioner told us. Um, and so that's another piece. So that's new information. You know, uh, before in the summertime, we were going based on studies in Europe um, and what they were doing and learning from in Europe. Um, and that's what part of what the, the rationale was from the state. Um, and now they're looking at and have been looking at what's been happening in the states, what's been happening locally. And I think and what's been born out here, certainly, you know, um, we've had the same experience. Uh, distance has not uh, closer and distances have not resulted in, you know, more transmission. Um, so that's also a personal experience. 
Uh, and so that's part of what I left out, in, in, but, but the commission has been clear in sharing that information and evidence with us. Um, and just to follow up on that, I mean, given that we're so close to the end of the year by the time any of this was in, is instituted, um, I mean, are these models for the fall? I mean, we haven't figured out yet how school opens and I, I don't know if any direction has come, but um, you know, it just, it feels a little bit for, for a district that has been open like ours, and I totally understand for districts that have not, but for districts that have been open like ours, um, it's, 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 it's a big burden, especially when there's also planning now hap needing to happen for September um, and what the models will be then. So I just, I don't know, was there any hints of what they're expecting for the fall? Yeah, great. In fact, in fact, there, there was more than just a hint. Um, uh, they are telling us to prepare for, for a full return, um, except for those students who have real significant medical, you know, um, uh, complexities. Um, that, that may change that sort of thing, but no, but that, that's what he's telling us to prepare for, which is what we've been preparing for very honestly in, in our budget and otherwise, you know, um, you are right. You know, I think one of the challenges for us is we've been doing such a great job that this the guidance isn't, isn't necessarily intended for us. You know, it's, it's primarily targeted at those folks who had, you know, one or two days in a week or full remote still, and there are plenty of places like that. Um, I think our success, <laughs> I mean, if we need to pursue a waiver for any reason, you can bet that uh, a, a, part, a big part of our logic will be, we need some more time because we've been doing this and our kids have had structural learning time in school this many hours, you know, more than most other folks, you know? And, and so you are, I, it's hard for me to know what other folks are living through. It's, it's hard for everybody in other districts. I don't wanna say it's easy for them and hard for us. I'm not trying to say that, but um, I do think we're faced with some challenges here. And they're honestly, as I said before, there's challenges that we tried to address before and we couldn't, you know? If we figure out lunch in the fall, we probably would be doing lunch, right? Um, but, you know, there's a, you know, springtime's coming, tents are more feasible now as, as weather gets warmer for lunch, perhaps. Um, we're a little, a little better at things, but it is a daunting task to, to, uh, to go from here. Definitely daunting. Thank you. Melissa. Mm -hmm. well, Thank you. Um, so Ben, my guess is 99.9% .9 of the schools in Massachusetts are probably freaking out like we are right now trying to figure out how to put all the kids in school. And regardless um, of the great intentions by the commissioner, I'm sure that more than a majority of the schools are physically not gonna be able to comply with what needs to be done if the regulations are gonna stay what they are right now um, to distance. I mean, we're in this situation for a reason. Most people chose hybrids or all remote for a reason. It wasn't just because um, we're in a pandemic, but it's because we don't have that spacing regardless, regardless if it's three feet or six feet. Um, so it seems to me that many school districts are physically going to be, it's physically impossible to comply with the regulations and be open. So I guess, my question to you is, um, are you keeping in touch with other superintendents? Is there any kind of advocacy going on um, to the commissioner that yes, we agree this is the right direction, but yet it's physically impossible? Um, knowing he is coming out strong, saying he's not gonna give waivers just for smaller reasons, but it's gonna come down to you, like you said, if we could do it, we'd be doing it. So yeah. what is the advocacy from the superintendents to give some pushback to the realities of how this may not work, even though we all, most of us want it to work? Um, so yes, I am in touch with superintendents. I mean, on a call today, um, you know, two different kinds of call, one with the commissioner, but also then one a much smaller group, also on Monday, uh, I, think, I can't remember last week. So, so um, it's not what you would think. I think most superintendents who haven't been in are like, yeah, we're getting in. We need to get in. I also think that, um, you know, we're many, many, if not most, you know, I'd say most elementary schools 
aren't like ours where they have, you know, the gym and the, at the cafeteria is the same room. Most folks have gyms and cafeterias. And if you have that, you're almost all the way to getting lunch, you know? So I don't think that, you know, you, and, and if you have a modern classroom, I mean, there's a reason that, that you know, West Parish is at 18 kids at, at three feet right now. Um, they have the space for that. But you couldn't put 18 uh, kids at three feet um, in some of our classrooms in other schools, you know? They're not large enough. So, so I, I, my sense from superintendents right now is we're gonna make this work, we can do this. Um, more so than, I mean, and, 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 and some folks, it's their first shot at in-person learning, right? So they really wanna do it. Um, I, I haven't got any sense of, of um, pushback. Doesn't mean that it's not happening, doesn't mean that it's, that it's not going to happen. Um, you know, but I haven't gotten that sense yet. Um, um, I want to move back just to something that Laura asked about in terms of, you know, is, you didn't really ask it this way, Laura, but, you know, is it worth it? You know, and, and this is a tough one for us from where we are, you know, I think, harder than other folks, you know. I said very clearly to a number of some, some students today, like, a return to norm normalcy as fast as possible is a really good thing, you know, and that's the same for us, you know. We're pretty close in many ways there. We're not quite there yet. Um, but, you know, for some folks in other districts where that hasn't been at all, you know, even if it's for four weeks at a high school, yeah, you should do it, right? Um, so I think we want to return to normalcy as well ourselves um, as fast as we can do it. Um, but we have to work through a bunch of things, you know, and, and I, you know, and uh, yeah, I, I don't, I, and, I, and it's hard for me to sit here and, and know exactly what we can work out at this point. Laura? Um, I just want to say, in, in response to that, like I, I hear that. I very much hear that. And I also hear advice you gave us early on, which was that creating a sense of normalcy and a regular schedule and being consistent would be a real strength for our district. And as a parent, I see that. Um, and I see how much having a consistent expectation for this year has benefited um, children. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I think, you know, I'm just such a cheerleader for what you've done and what we've done here. Um, and I, you know, I just, you know, it, it, it feels like that's been a great achievement. And I would hate to sort of have to go through hoops in a difficult situation that that can't work if it can't work um, and take that away. Yeah. Because our kids have had that. Kathy? Um, so I know, um, so I know you're trying everything, you know, um, looking at different ways to get us all in. Um, and I'm wondering if there are any other districts that have, you know, similar configurations like we do, as you say, West Parish is pretty easy. And I would think, you know, when we think of, oh man, not easy, but easier. Um, and I would think when you think about getting the middle school in, you know, more, you know, full time, they've got other rooms, other open areas. And so we have a few elementary schools that are really challenged. So I'm curious what other districts have been doing that have been in full time. Are they really the ones that probably have, you know, less enrollment to their space available? I mean, are they, they not space challenged? Um, and is there any thought to maybe plexiglass dividers? Would that be helpful at a lunchtime where you could get kids closer, but there's a way to physically separate without being completely, you know what I mean? They can see each other, they can talk, they could be closer together, but not breathing on each other. Um, I mean, I just can't imagine we'd want to go out and buy any desks for, you know, having different things, but um, but other kinds of equipment might help. Yeah, so so I know you're just you're you're using the buyers to illustrate the point. And yes, we're already looking at that. Already calls in that sort of stuff, especially around lunch and how it can how it can make you know more or more kids able to sit at sit at a table. If so, that's something we we'll probably have to ask you know ask about. But but yeah, so so um, we're looking into those things and literally uncovering things. You know, and and you know, I mean. 
I, I, I do need, it's helpful to know if the school committee, you know, is at a place where it's like, yeah, we need to do this, you know, and, and getting a sense here of, of where folks are. Um, and, and I don't, you know, uh, is helpful, honestly. Um, and I, and you do, I've, you, you folks are great in understanding the complexities and acknowledging those. It's, that's very, very helpful and actually a really big deal. Um, and also if folks are like, you know, yeah, we got to do this. That's also helpful to know as well. Um, Melissa. Oh, you're muted, Melissa. Thank you, Laura. Um, so if you're asking for our response to that question, I mean, my, my individual response would be to do the best you can. Um, there's only one more school committee meeting before this would go into effect, which is on March 24th. Um, so you have a chance to report out to us then. But I would strongly encourage to come up with the brilliant ideas that your staff does um, when they're faced with challenges, um, like uh, maybe staggering lunches and things like that, more so than it's done now. But um, I would hope that you would try to comply with the regulations and the expectations of Jesse and see where you come up. But if you can't, then you can report back to us on the 24th and we can make another decision. But I would try, I, I know it's a lot of work, but I would try to get every kid in um, just from what I know of. Um, things going on in the community. I want kids in school if they want to be in school. Joel? <laughs> Sorry, I clicked it <laughs> like nine times and it didn't go. Um, so um, feedback, I, you know, and this isn't, the people who seem to know about this already that have reached out to me, you know, again, seem to be cautiously optimistic saying, you know, like, one text I got was, oh my God, does this mean my kid will go back full day? That's amazing. You know, I'm very excited about it because they, they have no concept as to, you know, what it's going to take you guys to, to get through in order to make that a reality. But my, my anecdotal feedback that I'm getting from the community, I haven't really heard from any, anybody in the high school. I've heard from middle school and elementary parents so far is that they're very excited by the prospect that it'll be full day, five days a week, um, you know, so yeah, that's that's one bit of data that you have to compile with the rest of the surveys you're putting out and that sort of thing. I agree with Melissa, like you have to, you know, you can't, you're not a miracle worker, you don't have a magic wand, no one does. And so you're, you have, you're constrained by um, our district and hopefully there's creative solutions to it. Um, from a procedural standpoint, do you need anything from the program subcommittee, do you, or do you want to just keep this at the full committee level? Um, you know, we talked about this this particular eventuality of potential like months ago, but it was one of those, we were still more concerned about a full shutdown at that time, understandably so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because numbers are going through the roof at the, at the time, right? Okay. So um, just, at, do you need anything programs or do you want to keep this just like at a, at a admin full school committee level? Yeah, I think full school, school committee level. I mean, literally, yeah, I, I think so. Um, especially because it's helpful to throw things in front of everybody at once and then get input um, and get reaction. Um, and like you said, we, and then, and then, so that's helpful. And then also helpful to hear what, you know, what you folks are hearing from community members and we'll, and the surveys will, you know, will fill it out a lot. Um, but I think at this point, you know, March 24th is actually good timing um, because it gives us time to, to get some sense of what, where folks are and, and do a whole ton of work and then report back where we are. I think that's actually a good time. Before that, we wouldn't, we'd just be having a meeting to have a meeting, honestly. And I know you, you don't like that, Joel, so <laughs> none of us do. Uh, Kathy. Yeah, I'll also say that I, you know, I think we, we need to try to figure, we need to figure out how far we can find solutions and to understand what, what can't be done anyway. I mean, we can't just not go through a very serious exercise to, to try to figure out how to get more kids in. Um, I have heard from some of the older kids that they were ecstatic that they might have the possibility of being in school full time prior to the end of the school year. Um, so I think you may hear from some, from some students, they have, you know, maybe directly have some opinions on how they like, they would like their learning to be. Um, 
So, and, and, you know, we do definitely understand the complexities and we know that, um, you know, particularly at your leadership group level, there's just so much thought and effort that has gone into this. And there's a lot of um, being in the middle of staff and directives and, and all that is very hard to navigate while trying to be really compassionate and empathetic and, and collaborative with staff. So, um, you know, I have faith that that's will you know will be the process and will be the discussions going forward, just like they always have been. And hopefully, we'll get you know some really good creative ideas. And if you um, you know, I think also with your survey, you might be surprised at how many parents might come and say, you know, I'll take twenty kids out and sit on the lawn in the in the playground at lunchtime, you know, and have three cycles of kids or whatever the case may be. I mean, I think particularly at the elementary schools with the PTOs and active parents. Maybe there's some, some community help that can get us over the hump. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. No, I think, I think we have to look at, look at all possibilities here. Absolutely. Thank you. Laura? Um, so I agree that, you know, you have, we have to look at all the possibilities. Um, I, just, I just don't want it to be at the detriment of teaching and learning. Like, it is March teachers and administrators have a limited, you know, we're only human beings. And um, my own experience of the school that my daughter attends is that teachers and the principal are all very attentive to where children are right now and spending a lot of time doing the best they can um, given the, the deficits of, you know, in time and everything else. and. While I do agree, we have to look for as many creative solutions as possible. I think there's also, um, I, I just don't want it to be at the detriment of finishing the year strong for teaching and learning. Um, you know what I mean? I, it, it's just like, like, we're all human beings. There's only so much time. And, um, and kids are learning and we don't wanna have that be taken away while everyone's figuring out how to configure desks. Thank you. Samantha. I agree completely with, with what Laura just said. I honestly have so many feelings about this because it, it feels a little, I can, I, can, I can sense your frustration and I bet the frustration from other um, administrators, this feels a little bit like big brother, right? Like people who are, don't have their boots on the ground making decisions without really having a full sense of really what it takes. That's just what it feels like for me, um, listening to you guys and seeing the recommendations. Um, so I feel for you and I recognize how difficult this is gonna be. And I'm saddened that that's likely gonna take away from the good work that's being done already. But I do, I, I do understand, especially at the high school level, how important it is to get the kids in more. Um, the high school, from what I'm hearing in the community, high school students, from what I can tell, are struggling the most um, with the inconsistencies um, in just being sort of half days. And um, I think it's really important to get that cohort in as much as possible before the end of the school year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess um, it sounds to me like, you know, once again, we're, we're in some way being punished for doing a good job. Um, the, it, it's, it's really unfortunate that, that, you know, these mandates are coming down because a lot of communities have not done a good job. And we put into place a, a, a program that's working and, and is working for kids and is working Maybe not for all kids, maybe not not perfectly, but given the situation, it's 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 working well. Um, and uh, but we got to try to do um, do better. And, and um, you know, um, whatever you need, whatever you know, whatever you need. I mean, in some situations, it's going to be staffing. In other situations, it's going to be space. And um, staffing, at least, is possible. You know, space is making space out of nothing is is uh, is, is a lot more difficult, uh, from my experience. So, um, you know, I hope you're calling all the tent companies tomorrow morning. No, but we've uh, we've, we've already been calling. There's going to be a big run on tents. <laughs> that's, that's why we've already been calling. Um, yeah. 
but some good local folks who I think are are loyal, hopefully loyal to our schools. Um, the, I, I will say this, you know, I mean, in, in some ways, like I said in the beginning, I said it sort of, you know, sarcastically in a sense, but I, I do think that, you know, folks are, are trying to catch up to us. And, and I mean that in, in the sense that like the motivation for making these changes now is the same motivation that all of us responded to, you know, in the summer. Um, you know, and so I get that. It does add a lot of complexity to us right now. Absolutely. You know, ultimately it's the right thing, right thing to do. We're going to be caught in the weeds um, of how to get that done. And, and, and that's where, you know, the, the trepidation, the concern you hear in my voice and what, and what I'm saying here is, is really sort of thinking about our people and, and how are they going to do that at this time? Um, it's not really about the desire. I mean, I, I think we all want kids back on a regular school day as best we can. You know, it's more about um, just putting this on our folks who've been doing so much um, at this moment is, is really hard for, for, for me to do. Um, and, uh, and I think I'm hard for our principals to, to do for their folks, you know, to their folks in a sense. Um, but you know, again, we'll be thoughtful. We'll work really hard on it. We'll come up with the best ideas, and, and we'll, we'll get we'll get them done. Um, I just don't know. We I can't promise to anyone at this point that what those are going to be yet. But we'll we'll report back. We'll we'll keep folks in the loop. Really want to hear from families about where they are on this. That'll be very helpful to us. Um, you know, and 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 we'll keep keep uh, you know working the problem. Um, Samantha, I also just want to say just for the sake of saying that this would feel like it would make more sense if teachers were in tier one getting vaccinated because this does feel a little bit like we're doing everything all at once like let's get teachers vaccinated at the same time that we're trying to get everybody in which feels a little bit like a cluster um it would feel safer if i knew that all of the teachers were definitely vaccinated and you know had were got their last dose and we're that, what is it, like six weeks out that they're fully vaccinated? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem consistent um, with some of the precautions that we're trying to put in place. All right, well, I, think, I, think, I, think, I guess you know what to do, um, Kathy. Um, yes, I have just a quick question on the survey too. I assume it'll be parsed by le grade level. So we yes. Yeah. Who's yeah, giving feedback? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Melissa. I just want to end this by saying thank you to Ben because we are a leading example for other communities. We are so ahead of what other communities have done and should be proud of that. And I, I'm sorry that more frustration has to be put on the administration of this awesome school that has great staff that um, do come to school and we're on our like 105th day or whatever it is. Um, so don't let that get you down. I know you're you're running constant and obviously that's gonna ramp up again now, um, trying to figure this out, but just know that um, there's a lot of appreciation from this community for the work um, you've done as superintendent with your um, administrators and teaching staff and everyone in the schools making this happen. So don't let it get you down, just do the best you can and Gloucester always prevails. And like I said, there's other districts watching us and the governor knows it. Um, we're doing good, keep going. Thank, thank you, Melissa, I really appreciate that so much. And, and listen, I mean, you know, the, the committee has been really supportive and, 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 and more than supportive of me, I'm just really appreciated. I, um, and I, I take that, and as you said directly, you know, there are folks watching now, so many of our colleagues, you know, so many of my colleagues, our staff, you know, um, and what, what is so, been so great here this year for me personally is just knowing that everybody throws in and everybody wants to solve it and figure it out, you know, and we have differences and we have difficulties, but, but you know, I just really, um, what keeps me going is our staff, our teachers, our paras, our food service workers, our, as, you know, our bus drivers, school secretaries. I mean, everybody here at central office, um, just everyone working so hard and really just getting it done. And that attitude about how do we get it done? How do we keep improving? You know, that'll, that'll keep me going you know, all day long and all night long sometimes too. So, um, but thanks for those kind words. Let's really appreciate those. Okay, okay thank you, Ben. Um, 
I want to moving on. Yeah. So so um, this is might be a tough choice here. Um, James Cook is here and has been waiting patiently. It has as an uh, important presentation about our you know a career in voc tech education. Um, I want to make sure we give this its proper proper due. Um, and it's either tonight or maybe next time, next time, maybe a, a long meeting as well, where folks, I just wanna make sure that we can give, give James and, and this important, like really, really important educational program and the students and the staff to do it uh, the appropriate time. Is it, is it, is it, does it make sense to continue on this tonight? Um, it's up to the committee. We still have the budget and, um, uh, and uh, you know a number of updates, so uh, we still got a lot of work to do. Um, Melissa. So, from someone who who loves this topic more than anything, um, and James knows that because I've been harassing him since the day he became principal and the principal before him for these type of reports. I, I would say, unfortunately, our meetings are getting hijacked by COVID, and they are long conversations and they're important conversations. Um, so it's tough to plan other good stuff when we do have to do the work of talking about COVID and, and problem solving. I would like to not have this presentation tonight. Um, and I'm sorry if that creates any issues just because we do have a lot of work, but I think that because this um, presentation is very important and we learn a lot from it and I want it to have the time it deserves. Unless James ob objects. Is anybody else, uh, Joel? Is there any executive summary that can be done in a very short period of time that would give us a hint as to what is coming if the full presentation is moved to the next meeting? Or is that at that point, are you in it to win it and there's no? Executive? Oh, no, I, I can give the uh, elevator pitch version, Joel, if you want that flavor, you know, if that's what the committee decides, um, you know, I could give the whole report, I can come back, you know, I'm. I'm very flexible uh, if we come back you know we'll be further into the course selection process so there'll be that information as well uh, but i could definitely give an executive summary uh, version tonight i agree with melissa that this needs to be given due attention and there probably isn't due attention available tonight but i, I would be curious to at least have james give us a quick little okay that sounds reasonable let's not talk about it anymore and just do it um uh, so uh james uh five minutes so James, let me give let me give the elevator pitch, and if you want to expand on it, you can get you can do it. Okay, all right. In terms of career folk tech uh, education, um, this is a vital vital part of our community and our school community. It's something that is strong and needs and getting stronger, and we want to expand it. And if if you want to leave it that, James, you can, but you should you should add add as necessary. But I, sure. I do want to say that what's important to me about this, and I'll say it again and again, is. Um, I want to keep pushing back on the notion that a four-year college path is the only path out there. There are so many paths towards a successful career, a fulfilling life um, a, as an active citizen and community member, wherever you decide to settle. And um, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, the trades, whether it's, um, uh, you know, um, uh, biotech, technology, machine, um, you know, 20, uh, advanced manufacturing, all these areas that our kids can lead into from our uh, career book tech program, um, we have the opportunity to build more and more pathways for them, um, not only through this, but other ways. And, and, and this is a vital pathway for our students and our community. And uh, I hope we continue to strengthen it and grow it. And James will tell us where, where it is right now. So that's, that's my elevator, elevator pitch for tonight. James, you go ahead. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. And uh, you know, thank you for the different times you've stopped by the, the school to, uh, to talk about these things, uh, the advanced manufacturing most recently. Um, yeah, so um, to, to echo and, and deepen a little bit about what Ben said, uh, the CVTE programs are at the heart of our vision of the graduate. So it's, it's one of the places where um, problem solving, communication and collaboration skills are most explicitly developed. So, you know, the problem solving, communication, and collaboration skills, that's what we're trying, uh, that's what our vision is for all of our students. And that's what we wanna be happening in all of our classrooms um, to build a bridge to get the students there. And that's happening most visibly in, in the CVTE programs that we have. So I'll say that, um, 
Uh, I'll just remind folks that it was on uh, September 21st uh, in the fall that we were able to begin in-person instruction just a few days after um, in-person instruction uh, began at the uh, elementary and middle level. We were able to uh, begin um, in-person CVTE instruction very, very early in the year. Um, uh, I just want to highlight a, a few things uh, from this year. Um, uh, you know, is the continuation of our general and program advisory committees. Uh, those are, are going strong and we're making our plans for our usual spring meetings. Um, and the program advisory boards were actually planning on uh, meeting in person, um, you know, because we can distance um, in, in the shop areas and, and so on. So getting them in there and, and seeing what we've been doing. Uh, and, and, and some of what we've been doing is really uh, related to some innovations because of uh, you know because of COVID nineteen. I'm just going to highlight a few of those, um, which would include um, in the uh, auto shop um, cars donated to uh, replace the public bringing in cars to work on. We've had cars donated. Um, I can you know show you more about that. Get some pictures of what the kids are working on right now. So that's been um, getting those donations. Um, the uh, Lion Wa GEF grant funded auto teacher position added in uh, FY20 um, is another great thing. We're using the new lifts, uh, new wheel service equipment um, is really impressive and a lot of work being done on, on uh, what we've been able to do with both the GPS budget combined with the Perkins grant funds. So it's another thing we'd highlight um, in, the, in the short version of this. Um, in our carpentry program, uh, our students have helped build a partition for the preschool uh, to help them uh, use the, the gym space um, uh, in the preschool and divide up the area for educational purposes. Our students um, have uh, built desks for remote academy students um, through our carpentry program as well. Um, in the electricity program, we have mobile COVID-19 compliant electricity wiring boards um, that students can move around the space. Um, it allows them to be more distant from each other than our old static booths. Um, and we're now again beginning to move forward with a project we'd hoped for this year, which is a, a, a CVTE collaboration project of solar panels um, uh, to be um, it's a collaboration also with all four programs, all four vocational programs and our DPW um, that we're just, we're starting to uh, do that uh, replanning um, for next year, um, picking up where we'd left it off at the time of COVID. Um, and then in our uh, advanced manufacturing program, uh, we are, um, this summer, we will be resuming the General Electric Foundation grant uh, funded project that you all approved last year for a community adult advanced manufacturing expansion program um, in our schools uh, starting in the summer again, um, including, you know, with Matt Coy uh, teaching uh, those uh, classes here. Um, the advanced manufacturing program is also, uh, we have a new uh, computer lab um, and the classroom redesigned to be uh, really better for learning and also updating the computer equipment that the students use to design the products that they then use the milling machines and the lathes to actually create. Um, I do have my, um, I do have, you know, my show and tell here for something that they recently created uh, with the, uh, in the advanced manufacturing program. Lastly, I'll just uh, say something really super briefly about the um, uh, the uh, enrollment. So we had expected to add across all the programs um, this year. We would have added um, an additional five students um, as an increase in the program, despite having you know some of our uh, recruitment events have to go virtual, despite. Um, various things having to go digital last year, we were going to have a five person increase across the programs. But uh, because stu of, of uh, students being remote, um, we've had a slight decrease in um, the total number. So in other words, students who had, were going or planning on being in the vocational programs this year for various reasons, those families decided they would be remote. Uh, so we're in, at this time, we're looking for ways of, you know, making sure those students can um, resume or pick up uh, somewhere in their program uh, for next school year. So we do expect an increase um, again next year. 
So that's the that's the elevator pitch version. <laughs> Thank you, James. Um, uh, when you come back um, in a couple of weeks um, to follow up on this, um, I, I think a, a, the committee probably would like to hear about uh, plans for expanding this program into other areas. I know there's, there's some talk about that, and, and, and uh, it's, I think the community is very interested in that as well. Great. Um, yeah, sure thing. Okay. So thank you. Um, let's uh, keep moving, and thanks, um, thanks for your patience. Uh, and uh, all the good work you're doing at the high school. So, uh, Thank you, everybody. Uh, uh, Melissa, um, just a, a subcommittee report. Um, you had a, a personnel subcommittee uh, last week. Uh, would you like to just give us the, the elevator pitch on that? Absolutely. Um, so we, um, it was a joint uh, GTA negotiating team school committee uh, subcommittee meeting with the personnel subcommittee meeting. So the majority of our meeting was an executive session discussing um, executive session matters. But in public session, um, the discussion involved creating a job description for a finance director, which is a mid-level management position for that office. It's a new position. So we developed a job description that will come to the committee probably at our next meeting. We referred it to be enough for, um, to discuss a salary to go along with this before we bring it to the full committee. So it's pretty much just developing a job description. Um, it was a great conversation, a lot, lot of input. Um, we looked at a lot of resources and came up with a good plan to move forward with this position. And you'll hear more about it um, when you see it in a couple of weeks. Great. Any, uh, any questions? Um, I do, um, I do. You're creating okay. a position for what? It's a mid-level position in the finance office. Why? Um, because we find it necessary. We did some research um, in the city as a whole and looked at the structure of other departments and felt this position was necessary. So all of a sudden during COVID, we have no money and we don't have all the stuff you decided that you needed now after all these years, we haven't had one. So this has been in the works probably, we actually discussed it in June of last year. Um, this has been in the works for before COVID. It wasn't a decision that was made after COVID. It's just taken a long time because we are trying to be respectful to our budget and the circumstances surrounding COVID and how it impacts um, oh, just so you never had this position. I don't understand why it needs to be created. There's been some conversation about um, the responsibilities that would go with this position, um, that it would be a position that's not in a union. Um, yeah, you're talking about management. You're talking about finances. I mean, mm -hmm. what, what's the responsibility? I, mean, I have to see this a whole job description because- yeah, No, you will. Yeah, you will. Yeah. In a couple of weeks, we're going to put it before the whole committee hasn't seen it yet either. Um, okay. If you watch the Zoom meeting, you'll see us developing it, but it hasn't come to the full committee as a whole yet. We haven't had the full conversation yet, and we welcome these type of conversations when that happens. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. All right. Um, next order of item is is um, is the action, and um, we need to approve budget. Um, for FY22 um, for the public hearing. Um, and um, I don't know whether uh, it, Ben or, or, or um, Gary wants to. So I can, I can um, take this and Gary can fill in. So I can show, it's in your, it's in your, um, it's in your packet. packet, but let me show it just so I can talk it through for folks. Um, it isn't, it's not new information. It's just, um, we, we, Revise the presentation of it based on. Can you see? Is that large enough to see? No. No. Yep. How about that? That's better. Um, so my understanding of the budget you need to vote on is this summary budget. Um, no, no numbers have changed since we showed it to you two weeks ago and presented it. Um, the input we got was uh, to 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 subtotal the the budget. After all the uh, you know um, primary cost areas here, um, before 
we uh, showed the increase, included the increase on health insurance. So we've done that, and so that's the way it's, it's differ, different from what you've seen before. Excuse Which, me, Ben, you only have 1.89% in that budget. You know it went up five point something. I'm not sure. We all got notification when uh, is, it went up 5.8%. So we're going to have to discuss that. Sure. We don't have enough no, budget that's, on that. That's, that's how much the budget goes up if, if health care was not part of a budget. So, so, so 1.89%. Yeah. Let me just explain a little more. We'll get to health insurance in a moment and we can explain that. Okay. But, but just want to show folks how much our budget goes up without health insurance costs. Okay. A total of $724,000, which is equal to 1.89% increase from last year. Okay. When you in include health insurance and Gary, can you help me remember what we've estimated, I think we've estimated 8% increase on healthcare. Can you just help me help us remember that? Yes, that's correct. So uh, yep, go ahead. go ahead. So the health insurance goes up uh, approximately 8%. And then when you add that to the total of the other cost, that brings the total increase to a total budget of 45,638,000. That represents a 2.82% uh, overall, which is a $1.2,050,000 increase over last year, which is the same increase we had from the prior year, from FY20 to FY21. So this is consistent with years past. And uh, health insurance is uh, predicated based upon health claims. And we just got information that it um, has gone up um, about seven to eight percent. We'll get the uh, exact numbers when we find out uh, what the percentage increases were per plan. But uh, so far we got was preliminary information. Uh, and again, the, the total totals did not change. Uh, we presented this budget uh, in January to the BNF committee. Uh, ben and I presented the same budget uh, in February to the school committee. And then uh, it, at the last BNF committee, uh, we went through the entire budget book. Uh, and those budget books uh, will be available, all the supporting material at the city hall, at the library, at the district office, and online. And this is, uh, the purposes of this action item is to, uh, uh, for purposes, is to approve the budget only for purposes of presenting the information at a public hearing to be held on April 7th. Uh, we're gonna, as required by law, we'll publicize this information in the Gloucester News, and um, and then we'll hold the public hearing, and that's uh, one more step in the long process of approving the the uh, final budget uh, in June. So, um, any questions that I that I may answer for you? Is a new position in that budget? Um, the new position hasn't been finalized. And so it's not in this budget as per se. Um, we, uh, uh, any changes that we make, we'll uh, present the changes uh, at a later school committee meeting and a BNF committee meeting and also present uh, a finalized budget at the city hall uh, um, at the city's BNF committee as well. So this is still a work in process and uh, we're just moving along uh, according to plan. Okay, I can't uh, see everybody. So um, if you have a question uh, before we make a motion um, uh, and deliberate, um, just speak up. I can see everybody now. 
I'll fix that then, thanks. Um, if there's no more questions about the, uh, the, the substance, um, will we, you wanna make a motion, Melissa? No? I can make a, I can make yeah, a motion. No, yeah. I, I can, I was just surprised you picked me, that's all. Like. I don't know, you're the first person I saw. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'm make gonna, I'm gonna defer it to Kathy. Uh, thank yeah, you. I think we'll do it. Okay. Um, I make a motion that we approve the proposed fiscal year 2022 budget for public hearing as presented. Second. Okay. Is there any discussion? Can I ask a question just to clarify? Um, in our packet, it says that the public hearing is a BNF meeting. Is this going to a full school committee public hearing? It should be full school committee, yes. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Okay, seeing none. Uh, Maria, can we have a roll call vote? Kathy Clancy. Yes. Mr. Favaza. Yes. Chairman Poe. Yes. Ms. Prince. Yes. Mayor Taken. Present. Ms. Watson. Yes. And Ms. Wieson. Yes. Okay, it carries uh, six in favor and um, one present. Uh, thank you very much. And we'll move on to the next item, uh, which is the um, calendar for the school year 2021-22. And um, is Greg gonna do that or Ben? Greg will do that. Okay, Mr. Bach. Sure. Um, we don't have, we're actually back more to the kind of uh, calendar we are used to seeing. This past year's calendar uh, was quite a bit different with a number of days at the beginning of the year, a number of adjustments throughout the year. Um, so if we could take a look at, um, Ben, do you want to do, do display that calendar or just have people look at it in the packets? You, if you keep talking, I will get okay. it up and display it. Okay, no problem. Um, so just to orient you to the most significant change, um, we're, we're looking at a start date of August 30th um, with a first um, student day of August 31st. The first week uh, follows what is our uh, usual pattern. Uh, then we have Labor Day weekend. Uh, and then uh, what is different, is typically in September, there has been a um, half day at the elementary school for uh, professional development that has been a, a building-based day um, at, the, um, at the elementary schools. And that's been in usually within the first two to three weeks of of school. This year, however, uh, since the 14th of September is a primary election day um, and they will be voting in the schools, uh, which is quite disruptive. We've heard from principals over the years about uh, just what a challenge that is from a management perspective, a security perspective. Um, and so uh, we took a look at um, the two days like that, the November election day is typically has been a professional uh, development day on November 2nd. And the big change this year really is to move that professional day from falling on November 2nd and uh, to move that up to September 14th. And that does two things. Number one, it allows us to move um, uh, a, our, our big, biggest professional development day, full day, uh, up closer to the beginning of the school year. Um, it's timely for um, uh, training and the adoption of any new program. We are budgeting for, for example, a uh, new math program. Uh, actually, it's not a new math program. It is a, an update and a, a revision of the current math program, but there is some professional development that is involved with that. 
Um, and it'd be really helpful to have something like that up at the beginning of the year. Uh, this is also a reflection on the fact that um, we had 10 days this year at the beginning of the year. And there was a lot of really good feedback about being able to front load so much of that professional development. So we thought we would uh, try next year uh, to utilize, uh, take advantage of that primary election day on the 14th and do our full professional day on, on that day so that we avoid having uh, school and um, uh, uh, voting going on at the same time. That's the really uh, most significant change. If we go down through the months, October has a, uh, our typical half early release day for professional development usually falls in within the first week of October. Uh, then we have um, that Columbus Day and then parent conferences, those are really unchanged. Those are typically when they fall in the fourth, uh, third and fourth weeks of October. Uh, November would still have uh, no school on November 2nd. There just would not be a professional development day on that day. Uh, Veterans Day and then Thanksgiving, uh, those, day, uh, those days are unchanged. Uh, December is traditional to have a, a professional development early release. And then uh, the way that the dates fall, uh, we would be taking, it's a, a bit of a shorter um, Christmas break, or uh, sorry, uh, winter break. And that would be a half day on Thursday, the 23rd. And then um, the 24th is off as, as well as the following week. Returning on January 3rd, the Monday, the January 3rd. Um, again, uh, actually the month of January, we sometimes have professional day uh, in that month, but um, in conversation with the high school and the middle school, as far as um, grading periods and also uh, midwinter bench benchmark assessments at the elementary schools, we decided to shift the February early release just a little bit later uh, to the 8th of February to allow those assessments to come in and for grading to be done, uh, which leaves us a half day um, early release in March on the 22nd. And um, the February, sorry, February and April vacations are, are typical in the third week. And the last day of school would be um, without any snow days would be on June 14th. So again, it's a more of a return to a standard um, schedule with the one exception of moving the professional delay in November to the 14th of September. I'd be happy to answer cool. any questions if I can. Cool. Thanks. Um, my only comment, uh, we did this last year, the draft came in with the Friday for Labor Day weekend, the day off, and we changed it last year to have them go to school for that day because it's still a three-day weekend with the holiday on the Monday. And there was discussion last year about the fact that you know if you're in for three days and out for four, those three days kind of get they're not very productive days, and you're still kind of starting back over when you get back in on the seventh, trying to get these kids out of the summer mindset and into the school year mindset. And so I'd be willing to again take that we have now the day off on the 3rd of September and make that a school day. So they have a, a four day week to start out for three days back for four. So it's, you know, more of an intro, more of a reintroduction into school year thinking and less of a prolonged summer thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, Laura. Thank you. So, um, sort of referring back to our earlier conversation, we had talked at some other point about having some summer, potentially having some summer programs um, to deal with um, sort of all the changes from this year. Um, I'm, I'm assuming none of that is you know scheduled or planned, but I'm just looking at this starting in August, which just feels early. I know that's not rational, just feels early. Um, um, you know, just is there anything about how we, if if we do end up having programs in the summer, 
and then going into school on August 31st, just, um, you know, I don't know if it matters. It may, it may not matter if there's a break between those two things, um, just something I'm observing. Uh, when you are referring to summer programs, are you referring to professional development or the summer school? I'm, prof uh, I'm referring to sort of vague conversations we've had about um, summer schools yep. to uh, identify for learning loss potential, you know, for potentially. Sure. Uh, so I'll give you an idea of the dates on that. Just um, I understand your, your point about giving a break from uh, the end of, uh, of that kind of learning law school and the start of school. Um, this is really um, in line with uh, not only past practice, but also the contract as far as uh, when we would begin. Um, but we are planning on uh, being able to start uh, at the elementary schools in particular, be, uh, planning on starting at June 28th. Um, and the way things fall, there's no interruption from 4th of July in the midweek. Uh, so we end up being able to do five weeks and finish by Ju uh, July 29th. So that ends up providing, um, you know, good four solid weeks before school starts again. So I, I feel that's a fairly reasonable break uh, before starting again. Yeah, okay, thank you. Melissa? Thank you. Um, Greg, can you remind me again why we have Friday the 3rd off in September? Um, this is a, I do recall the discussion well, and then things got obviously changed from, you know, with the, the beginning of this year and the professional development uh, 10 days. Uh, it has been, uh, when we look back at, at, you know, the way it has been done in the past, and, and so we put in what had been, um, you know, typical practice. Um, and if the school committee would like to have that Friday, it's a very easy change and that would adjust the um, June uh, 13th would then become the last day of school. And Thank if, you. Uh, if I'm directed, uh, it's no problem. I can make that change very easily. So there's nothing in the GTA contract that says- um, uh, Oh, you know what? I'm I, I, I need to, so I glad you mentioned yeah. that because I Thank think you. that is one of the things that we looked at. Um, and then it didn't, um, our, our, the beginning of the year was uh, dominated by the 10 days off and, and their whole redesign of the schedule. But I do believe we actually did look at the contract, um, Ben. And I yep. think there is language about that. I, I can pull that up right no, now. I, I, I'm looking at it right now. Okay. Um, you know, there, there definitely is. I mean, I, I can, if I'm reading this properly, uh, it's, it says that if the teacher work year starts before Labor Day, and they're not required to work on the Friday before Labor Day weekend. Okay. Oops. <laughs> I would draw a suggestion from last year. <laughs> so huge thanks to Rachel Rex on that, just, just so you all know. Yeah, um, and the superintendent was on top of it too, just for the record. Yeah, <laughs> to the bag. I, I, I'm going to give Rachel the credit here, Ben, although we know we always give you credit. But so that solves that issue. But um, my question is, why are we not having school uh, professional development on the 2nd of November instead of like change the December 7th to November 2nd? Does that make sense so that? Those are uh, the December 7th is a um, half, it's an early release, whereas the November 2nd is a full day. Right. So what? So we wouldn't bring teachers in without students. I'm just trying to think, why would we have an extra early release? Because I mean, I know they count as full days even on an early release, but as someone who advocates to have their kids in school as much as possible, it seems to me December has so many days off with the vacations already. So in my mind, it makes sense to have professional development on the 2nd, and that way we don't need an early release on the 7th. If you have professional development on the second, you're adding another work day. Yeah, it's it's a half, it's an early release on the right. second. Right, so we would get out a day earlier at the end. Are you, you're, are right. you saying having school on the seventh, on the on November 2nd? No, 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 absolutely not. Having the teachers do professional development on that day so that we don't have to have an early, early release in December for them to do it. Uh, the, Melissa, the problem is we have two election days. 
Right, uh, no, I understand. We have to pick primary and, and we only have one day where we pay the teachers for a full day of professional development. So we can't fill both of them with full days of professional oh, full days, okay. I and and uh, Melissa, we actually did reduce by moving it to the 14th uh, that um, that uh, elementary early release day that had typically been there gets uh, taken care of. So we, we've actually reduced the number of uh, early okay. release days over uh, the prior calendar. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Kathy, you had your hand up, but you took it down. Uh, it was just that Melissa just asked the same question. Okay. Just gonna ask. All right. Um, anybody else? Anything else before we vote on this? Okay. So okay. we we did not change anything. Um, so I'll make a motion that we um, approve the 2021-2022 uh, um, school calendar as presented. Second. Okay. Is there any discussion? Okay. I just want to apologize again for suggesting an amendment that would be in violation of our contractual obligations. I will be uh, glad that was cleared up before we took a vote. Thank you. Okay. Um, COVID saved you from last year, I guess. All right. Um, all right. Uh, Maria, could we have a roll call vote? Kathy Clancy. Yes. Mr. Favaza. Yes. Chairman Pope. Yes. Ms. Prince. Yes. Mayor Taken. Yes. Ms. Watson. Yes. And Ms. Wieson. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. It passes unanimously. And we're going to move and we're going to move on to um, uh, discussions. Um, and the first one up is returning to in-person school committee meetings. Um, uh, with the guidance that um, uh, we've been getting um, from um, the governor, it would appear that um, the potential of returning to in full, um, into um, uh, in-person school committee meetings uh, may arise sometime in April. And um, I just wanted to um, put it out tonight that we start thinking about this. I'm not looking for any sort of um, decisions, but um, as I said earlier, um, you know, we had almost 62 people um, uh, participating this evening. Um, and um, so there's, there's two different considerations, the need to be back in person, as well as the, um, the, uh, the fact that we've got great, great, much greater participation. So um, it's just a discussion, Joel. Sure, I, I think that, um, you know, the difference between whether we can and whether we should are different. And I think that, you know, we're, we're desperate to get back in, in the classroom because it's a, a markedly better experience for students when they're in a classroom. But I'm curious if we're not having a, a markedly better experience in what we're doing now. And, you know, is there a benefit to the community in keeping it like this? Is there a benefit to us in keeping it like this? Um, or is it, you know, are we more productive in person? So you know, I don't have the answer to that, but, um, you know, again, I wouldn't want to tie it to, oh, well, the students are going back, we should go back. I'm not looking to not go back or go back for safety reasons. I think we can do either safely, you know, but I am curious as far as how the community is better served and whether our productivity goes up or down by getting back in there, being masked and, you know. Um, so. Yeah, I agree. I, the. Um... We, I did invite Grant Harris here tonight. As you'll remember, um, earlier this year, we approved the expenditure of, of a, about $3,000, I think, um, to buy equipment that would allow us to do a hybrid sort of model where we were partially in person and but still retain some of the um, Zoom capacity. Uh, so um, before we continue this conversation, I think we ought to let Grant um, give us an update on, on um, whether that will work, <laughs> whether it's a possibility. Okay, I can do that. Uh, it, it is a possibility. Uh, obviously, due to the reconfiguration of the space uh, at the preschool, I don't believe we're going to be able to meet in the current location. 
uh, I, I believe we discussed about possibly using the library or the uh, one of the other locations, or another room within the high school, which um, the equipment's been ordered. It should be here shortly, actually. A lot of the items were actually back ordered. Obviously, everyone's buying video conference equipment during this pandemic. So uh, the equipment will be in and it most certainly will be viable. I, I'm just not sure what the committee's sort of, um, what, how do you feel how do you want it to set up and arrange? I mean, I think the initial configuration was a central uh, large TV with a device pointing at the table with everyone equally distanced apart. Um, but then that most certainly can be done in the manner through a single screen. One person would be presenting the agenda, put it up on the screen like they did in the old school committee room. Um, it's completely viable and you can most certainly have the people participate remotely and they, they can come talk, speak over the speaker as well. I just don't know if you have a need to have people be in person from the public side to speak or is it going to be you in person and the public attending remotely? We don't know. Um, okay. We're trying to figure that out, but it's good to know what's possible. Mm -hmm. uh, so what you're saying is that um, one model would be that the, the school committee be, uh, and Diff different administrators would be in the room in person and that the public could um, participate remotely? Correct, um, as they do now. Yeah, but but the school committee would all be in, a, in, in one room. Correct. In, in, in person. And if, if for whatever reason a school committee member cannot make it that evening or a presenter or a guest, they can still join as if they would, they, they do now. So you have flexibility. And what if some of the public wanted to, to uh, uh, attend in person? Um, that is possible. We would have to look at configuring the room to you know, appropriately space things out sure. uh, so that they can actually see the screen as well. We'll have, to, we'll have to look at arrangements of that. But I think a simple easy phase one would be, it's easier for us to work on the committee being there and the public stay at stay remote. Um, but we, I'm open to any and all suggestions. I, I would like to get the hardware built, set up, and I want to run some demos, some tests. Me and my staff will definitely be putting it through its paces to make sure that it's just, it, it, it's uh, it's going to meet all our needs, and um, yeah, okay. And I, I encourage every one of the school community to join in this test if they would like. Okay, well, they all want to talk now. So, uh, Kathy, and then yes. Melissa, then Samantha, then Laura. Um, yeah, I I'm in favor of um, coming back in person. I watched the Board of Ed meeting the other day and they had people in um, in kind of longer debt, longer tables, doesn't matter what it is that you're sitting at. They were sitting facing the same direction like you like our classrooms are currently configured. So they have the distance on the side, distance front to back, and they're all facing the same direction. I think the chair was sitting perpendicular. So um, I think it probably is going to be helpful for any of us to kind of look to see what configurations are people doing out there that are um, that we think work? I know they had a cameraman going from person to person, which I can't imagine we would do that. But um, it, it was just uh, to me, it was a good example of how it worked. I think people that were speaking were off in some other room, and they came in to enter, and they did their part in the front of the room, and then they left when they were finished with their either public comment or their presentation, if they were a speaker, um, as part of the meeting. So um, anyway, I thought it was a good, you know, good example. And as a as a visitor watching the meeting, to me, it was a very, you know, very good experience seeing what was going on. It was handled very well. Actually, that's a, that's an interesting point. You're talking about having the public in a different location there's nothing that prevents us from having another device or workstation in a basically a guest speaker location. They could go into another room, you know, separate from the, you know, the committee, or they could do it in a separate section in the same room as well. Yeah, this we have options. Technology allows us to do those things. Okay. I forget what I said, Melissa. Thank you. So um, the what I envision is, and, and what other school committees are doing, is that the school committee as a whole is back in person. Um, they're sitting six feet apart or three feet apart or whatever they feel comfortable that in the tables. And there's a camera um, posted that can see all of us and where we're sitting. Um, if you remember, we used to have our meetings televised from City Hall Live. So this is how I envisioned this happening. Um, with the exception of maybe taking public comment 
from the public right now. Um, I believe the gathering rule is 25 and we'll have to run all this through Karen Carroll, I'm sure on the Board of Health before we make the final decision. But um, having 25 people in the room where we're eight or nine members with some administration, I think we should be doing everything in person, the whole committee, not televising half in, half out. That's a remote participation issue. Um, I think the full committee should be there. Um, however, have Zoom for the public at home um, to do public comment, but presenters in person. Um, I think it's hypocritical that we're doing this when our staff is in school. I know I go to work and engage with the public every day. A lot of people are now. So I think we're at that part where we're starting to come back and I think we can do it safely and that we have an obligation to do that. Um, I think we'd have to look at the open meeting law um, type of situation if, we're, if, you are, if we are gonna decide that some school committee members can be home um, and just zoom in. I can't imagine the semantics of trying to run a meeting, having half a, a committee member on Zoom and the rest in a room. Um, to me, that seems complicated and can create problems as far as discussion wise. Um, we are a small group. We have plenty of spaces in the school that we could set up safely. Um, so that's what I would like to see, and that's what I strongly advocate for as soon as possible. Just like getting back in person to negotiate our contracts. You know, I mean, we're at that point where we're coming back. You know, we're going back full time as a state on April 5th. That's only a couple weeks away. I believe firmly that we as a committee, all members should be in person. Um, however, keeping the public engaged by having that live feed like we used to have at City Hall makes absolute sense. Okay. Samantha? Thank you. So I'm in favor of going back in person. In fact, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, <laughs> reason to get out of the house. <laughs> but um, I don't want to limit access to the community. I think that we've been able to um, open up our meetings to the greater community, especially parents who can't really make a seven o'clock meeting. I think that's who we want to be watching our meetings or the, or the parents and seven o'clock is tough with kids. So I think we need to um, continue to have that remote access, I hope um, forever. I think that, that that is a good silver lining that's come out of this, that I hope we can continue. So Grant, thank you for your work on that. You're welcome. Laura? So um, I agree, I think we should be in person. Um, two things, I don't think it's hip hypocritical that we're, uh, we've are we been doing this on Zoom. I think we've been doing our best here. Um, and Grant has been looking into getting us the technology to allow access to our meetings if we're in person. So I I feel like you know we've been doing our best with a difficult situation and it's been a real silver lining that so many people have been able to participate. Um, and um, I think there's a real question and you alluded to this grant of, I think we should be there. I think, um, uh, and I think we have to figure out what the, what the regulations are because chances are most of the time, not many people will come, but if there's a hot button issue, you, you know, we, we're not gonna have like a bouncer, right? We're not gonna have someone at the door saying like, sorry, you're at 25, you know, it's, it, that feels, you know, exclusive. So I think find I think starting off with just us there, access to the public, oral communications, you know, from the public, being able to take feedback, you know, all the things that have been such a benefit here while we're in person would be would be what I would advocate for and where I would start. You, you make a very interesting point because if you think about where we used to hold the meetings, the capacity was what maybe 20, 30 people maximum. I mean, there's been public meetings that have been close to 500 attendees. I mean, that, that's our physical limit. I mean, the only place that we had that could do that would be an auditorium. So you're, as uh, Mr. Pope had alluded to, that the participation from the public is so much greater. I mean, why would you want to restrict that? That's it's a phenomenal um, benefit to, to the community. Plus, we also have the recording. So it's available right away. So there's another benefit as well. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. So... Um... Just for, for uh, some of, some people may may remember this um, 
or they may not. Um, but this, uh, at Cairo's um, um, Studio 1623 has the capacity of broadcasting live. Okay. And, um, but they don't have the capacity of getting um, live input from, from, from the residents. So um, it'd be interesting to look into whether, um, whether there was some sort of uh, way of, of, of um, working with, with that equipment um, and in turn, you know, uh, mixing it with our equipment so that people could call in, um, but in general um, could watch it on, you know, on cable TV live. I don't know. Okay, Joel. I think going back to 1623 will be a huge step back from the platform we're on right now. This way, anybody with an internet connection and a smartphone can watch these meetings that you'd have to have a cable subscription and yeah. only watch, you know, and watch it live only, but not on demand afterward. I think we'll be a huge step back as far as accessibility. Um, my only other question, and again, I, I don't think that I'm necessarily opposed to us coming back is, you know, like right now where, where I'm sitting at least, I've got two monitors up. I've got a ton of ability to, as we're discussing issues, when presentations are coming through, they're crisp, they're clean, they're on, on, that I can see versus, you know, straining your eyes to look at the big TV like we used to. And so I'm curious, are we gonna be a more effective body back in person than we are right now? And then the second thing I would point out is that we um, had agreed previously to the pandemic to move our meetings from um, the preschool to the library. And I hope we'd stick with that if and when we do return in person. But I'm just curious to hear what other people, there seems to be some passion about getting back together in person. And I'm curious why, if and why you, you would think that that's a more productive meeting, um, you know, I guess it's a question that colleagues. Okay. Samantha. Joel, I can only speak to myself, but I personally feel like I'm a more effective communicator in person. Um, that's just my own personal um, comfort level. I'm not as comfortable looking at people on a screen. So I think we can have uh, more authentic conversations in person. Um, Laura and I also didn't really have the benefit of having many meetings in person. <laughs> We've been doing this completely remote for most of the time. So um, it, it would be nice to see people in person and, and have that personal relationship again. Laura? And uh, Joel, also an answer. I mean, I think there is also a, I, I don't think it's a product, productivity issue, but it's a, a modeling issue to show that we're in person in a room with each other. Um, I think, I think makes an important statement. Um, you know, I do think that um, it may be that there are times when members can't attend in person. And so that doesn't mean they'll be remote. They just won't attend. Um, you know, this has allowed in some cases, you know, especially with lack of childcare, uh, resources, this has helped. Um, so I think there, I think there's give and take, but I think, I think overall it'd be good to be in person as a body and also as a, from a, from a role model perspective. Okay, anybody, anybody else? I just, just for the record, um, remote participation by, um, by members of the committee has been, um, you know, a, a possibility since long before this. I remember the first time we tried it, um, or the city council tried it, and, 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 and Bruce Toby was calling in from uh, Florida on some critical vote. So um, that's been in place for a long time. So I don't think there's any real issue about if a member had you know had a reasonable reason for not being at the committee that they 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 couldn't participate remotely um, if we had that capacity so um, we will continue to try to refine all of these um, these ideas and come up with it with a uh, you know we, we'll work with grant and come up with a a, a model that we might um, uh, take a look at and, and see if it'll work. But I, I clearly we're not going to be meeting at, at the um, at the preschool. Um, it would it would have to be either uh, either at some place at the high school and perhaps even the middle school. But if, if Grant says the equipment's at 
the high school, then, then uh, um, I'm assuming that this equipment is not going to be exclusively used by the school committee, that it's going to be, uh, be able to be used by, for other um, uh, meetings and, and such. Uh, would be my assumption. I don't. I maybe that, that is correct. That was we originally had the discussion about the funding source. It wasn't just a school committee asset. It's a it's a district asset. Right. You need to move it. It's you know, it's large, but it could be moved from location to location. But I, I know that James and some of the staff thought that it would be very useful when they're doing some training and education to be able to have staff together in a large room and be able to use that as well. So this, I think this kind of type of system will definitely prove valuable far beyond just the school committee. And we may look at this type of model for other options in other schools as well down the road. So so one room that we might might consider would be the lecture hall too. Absolutely. Sure. Well, if it's in the library, I should be able to wheel it to the lecture hall. Well, I'm just saying, but that, yeah. that uh, just because of the way it's, it's set up, that may work um, too. Um, Samantha. I'm just wondering, is there a location perhaps at West Paris that doesn't allow community members if we if they are to come in person to have access to the hallways? Does that make sense? Right. So the, the library at the high school allows community members to have access to the school building. Does West Parish have a place where you could just walk into the cafeteria and the rest of the school building is locked so there's no security issues? The, be separated that way yes yeah but there's no there's no there's no large seating per se there's no auditorium at west parish but yeah the, the building was designed to lock the academic wing if you had to um, it says the member from west gloucester <laughs> <laughs> but, I'm from but, 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 but west parish does have the capacity of of keeping the gym and and the that wing of the building open and keeping the academic areas uh closed off um i'm just wondering if that's a something that we should consider just yeah. for security reasons melissa um do we are we going to have to make sure of a custodian is there i believe the high school has custodians at night still maybe um because i think we have to have a custodian available if we're going to be in the building and that's why we were at the preschool because we didn't need to do that right that's a consideration there are probably some other considerations that we haven't even thought of yet but uh, so this is just um, a preliminary um, discussion and uh, giving um, giving um, the administration and, and the rest of us some some direction to work at uh, to, to, to approach so um, so we can move on and uh, we'll report back right Grant absolutely thank you sir um, the next order of uh, business is uh, the uh, East Gloucester Veterans Memorial School Building Committee update. Um, uh, who wants to start on this? Are you going to start, Ben or Kathy? Yeah, I can start. So, so uh, this month there are three, at least three, um, uh, school building committee meetings as we head towards the submission to MSBA. Excuse me on, de on design development uh, phase. That. That submission will, um, there's a couple of things, excuse me. It, um, uh, it's sort of a check-in that we're 60% 60, 60 done. Our design team is 60% 60 60 done on, on the you know, final, final uh, development of the design documents. The de design isn't changing, it's becoming more detailed because they need now you know, architectural drawings that you can build something from as opposed to just schematic drawings. Um, so that's part of it. Also, the other very important piece of it is the, cost estimates that they'll be doing this this month or doing now they're already doing them obviously um and um reconciling that to make sure that at this point in the design development phase that we um the design continues to be on budget um as you know as we make design decisions and just uh further develop the you know the um the drawings of the building um, i want to i want to be clear what i'm saying is, is the design's not changing it's it's that it's becoming more detailed, and more specific, you know, for everything from, um, uh, you know, paint colors and soffits and, you know, what's in a hallway and sort of thing. Um, but the design everyone's seen is essentially the same design. Um, and then we'll reconcile those uh, those cost estimates too. Uh, those are the two big pieces of it. Um, we've also uh, We'll come back to the school committee, as we mentioned, uh, in March, uh, on the March 24th meeting and give you a, 
a, a more complete um, presentation on the progress made on uh, particularly on the from the exterior and interior subcommittees of the school building committee, um, as well as uh, updates from uh, you know the number of meetings that have happened uh, related to traffic, related to um, working with the fire department and police and 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 other 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 folks that the design team's been working with. Uh, you, but you can expect that on March twenty fourth. Okay, and and the um, the joint school committee um, city council meeting on um, April 1st will be completely devoted to the building project. Um, and there'll be a presentation, the traffic engineer will be there um, as well as um, uh, the design team and, um, and, uh, and our OPM and perhaps even our, our con uh, contractor, uh, contract manager at risk. Um, the, um, just to elaborate a little bit on the on the reconciliation of the what they're doing now is they're they they're sixty percent done on the final um, working drawings um, from which the building will be built and and they're going they doing cost estimates and the cost estimates are done there are three different cost estimates done one by the um, by the contractor, one by the design team, and one by our OPM. And not that they do them themselves; they generally um, have um, subcontractors that, that specialize in this. And then they take those three um, different um, uh, uh, estimates, and and they they all sit down in a room and and look at what's different between what one thinks something's going to cost and what the other ones think this something's going to cost. And then they kind of hash it all out and, and come up with a final budget. Now, if that budget exceeds um, the budget that we um, approved, then they'll start talking about doing um, uh, some um, um, value engineering is the term that they, they use, and which is basically cutting costs uh, somehow. And, um, so that they get back in line. So that, that's the process that we're in right now. Um, and uh, there'll be a lot of other things that we'll be taking up. What the, the, the um, uh, help me with this. Uh, when we specific, uh, specify a, a particular product um, uh, that's gonna go into it, like, like um, the, the control systems for the eating systems that are compatible with all the other control systems we have in the city. Um, those kind of decisions, uh, as opposed to just giving it a generic um, specification. So there's, there's things like that, that that are being talked about now, but that's why we're having so many meetings um, this month is to, um, in preparation that for that um, 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 design development submission at the end of the month. Kathy, anything to add to that? No, I just wanted to say we've we definitely continued conversations with Safe Routes to Schools. So that'll be um, part of information that will be coming forward as well as it relates to this project. All right. Okay. Any questions? Okay. We're, we're closing in on it. Um, the MCAS letter that I referred to earlier. Um, uh, that we voted earlier, I, I signed it, it's been sent off, it's in your packet, just uh, basically so you can see see it and, and the public can see it. Um, is there any uh, anything else um, before we adjourn that anybody would like to uh, uh, bring up? But Melissa. So I know there's a lot of talk and there'll be continued talk about solutions for the new school and traffic and things like that, but I'm wondering, um, knowing that it is two years away still, and there's lots of time to talk about it. Um, will there be conversations on the school side, like maybe through the program subcommittee about doing staggered release times or start times or things like that um, to help with the process? I mean, it just seems if we start talking about these things now and get feedback from the community, um, it might be helpful to see that the school committee is looking for solutions and not trying to have other people give us solutions. Um, we have done staggered release times at O'Malley when we had fifth grade um, up at that school for a couple of years. I think East Gloucester was doing staggered release times. Um, 
So when is the school committee as a whole going to have that opportunity to talk about solutions presented, um, I mean, or regarding the traffic and other matters involving the new school? Well, if you're talking about, you know, operational um, issues, um, there's time to talk about that. Um, you know, it, it's it's not going to affect the design right. uh, or, or, or the construction of the building. Um, and certainly uh, operational um, issues are, 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 there's a couple of years to talk about that. And um, so I guess my concern is, we, you know, we're reaching out to uh, people like the traffic commission to give feedback, but yet we haven't discussed it amongst ourselves. I mean, a lot of it is common sense. You know, can we put in blinking lights like Gordon has um, to cross the streets? You know, what? let's be firm and get our messaging out there about the policies we have about crossing highways and unsafe areas um, and things like that. What is What exactly is busing going to look like? How many kids are going to be on the bus? I mean, because there's so many conversations going on by people that we haven't had direct contact with. And the facts that they are putting out there are not true. So it just seems to me we need to get hold of this conversation and get actual information out to the public, like exactly how many buses are going to come, how many kids may be on those buses, um, what does busing look like in the past between East Gloucester and veterans before COVID came into the picture and everyone started driving their kids to school? Um, what, how we've done one ways for 20 minutes a day at East Gloucester and it was very successful. I mean, we're not really trying to come up with new things. We can actually look to what we've been doing with other schools and try to incorporate those ideas now. And it just seems like if the school committee starts talking about it, you know, we can keep control of the conversation so that everyone is talking the same facts because right now we're not. And there's a lot of drama out there. I mean, there's talk about kids dying and that's concerning when you hear that. And so I just feel like we need to be talking more about traffic and solutions amongst ourselves so that the right message is getting out there to get good, solid um, recommendations back if people have ideas to help us based on facts, not speculation. Because it just seems like there's too much speculation right now because there's too many different conversations going on with different groups. So uh, how do we do that? I mean, we, you, you and Kathy are the building committee representatives. So two of us, this group as a whole, including Ben and, and Gary, you, you're part of this group as well. So it just seems to me, we should be expanding the conversation and deciding how to move forward as well, not just all these different groups of people talking and not talking facts. So how do we rein this in? At, at the joint meeting, the presentation, the, the, there'll be a presentation on the traffic, the recommendations um, are fairly clear that the um, that the traffic engineer made as for what can be done about local traffic, but um, and that was why um, it was presented to the traffic commission uh, for them to weigh in on um, what could be done on on the public roads. Um, they took their um, mandate and, and expanded it um, exponentially, um, but. Um, you know, you're right. There's a lot of um, misinformation. There's a lot of uh, uh, of things. So hopefully, um, that conversation will start um, at the joint meeting. So that's the beginning of April, April first. Um, so we'll, you know, we'll get a presentation, and from there we can uh, we can start having conversations about uh, um, what the school committees. Um, uh, would like to see happen. So we got a lot of hands up. Joel, you're first, I think. Sure. I, I think to piggyback on that, again, prior to COVID kind of detonating everything, we had just begun to think about encouraging more busing over at West Parish to kind of alleviate the, the drop-off issues they were having. And so this may be a time to kind of, you know, revisit. We were, we're kind of thinking as a committee that we want to encourage busing and promote busing and maybe Look at the busing fee and look at the busing rules and say this would be a good time to because that won't be an overnight solution maybe this is a good time after that joint meeting to start you know 
we're using busing as a viable option and trying to discourage drop off and encourage bus usage as, as one of the, the ways in which this problem gets addressed. So it'd be cool if we as a committee took that back up, you know, in the upcoming months. Yeah, that's a, that's a really important thing. Um, Kathy. I just wanted to follow up too on um, the conversations with um, our representative for safe routes to schools. I mean, exactly what you say, Joel, how do you make getting on the bus cool again? How do we, how do we, um, and I know the school committee needs to have conversations, but we need to, I think this April 1st meeting to have the conversation about circulation at the school and some of the suggestions that are not just on the school property, but on the roads around the school have to be a community conversation. You know, obviously we can be leading and, and, um, and definitely giving it much more visibility and thinking it through and surveying parents and trying to um, really put in place. I mean, what Safe Roots to School can do is help us educate families, not just the new school families, but literally start educating across our schools now so that when we do open the new school, hopefully things like meeting somewhere and walking, you know, four blocks to school as a group could be part of a fun part of school for people and a family, you know, maybe it's a way that parents get to know each other better, right? So, I mean, it's, there's a lot of things about building community that also will help us. They use the term arrival and dismissal, not drop off and pick up. So just the semantics of the fact that we want to dismiss students to their parents doesn't mean the parents need to pick them up. So um, I think they'll have some really good ideas to, to bring forth from an education perspective and from a resource perspective, not necessarily money, but um, best practice, you know, other places that have kind of changed culture and, and what can we possibly do? So um, I definitely was thinking that this woman from Safe Roots to School should either come quickly to the full school committee, maybe by, you know, next fall, when we can start having conversations about kind of normal operations of traffic and school and busing and things. Um, I think anything earlier would be premature given the situation we're, we're in um, and things are not typical. And we can then go from there as an education, as a safety discussion at BNF, um, you know, all that. So, uh, so I think April 1st is kind of a key point for everybody to gather all that information, figure out you know, how, how we want to move forward with, with the pieces of it um, in terms of advocating on the city side for things like the lights and things like that. Okay. Samantha, you had your hand up, you still? No, I also want to just continue the conversation about increasing bus ridership. And I think Kathy and Joel covered all the pieces, so thanks. Ben? Yeah, just a, maybe last piece on this, is that, is that you know, the intention of going to the traffic commission, the school committee, the city council, safe routes, um, uh, and also hearing from the public is to um, generate ideas that will make this work better and be safer. You know? And so that, that's the process we're in, and, and which is great and very helpful. And I just want to encourage folks, yourselves and others, to keep doing it in, in such a spirit. Um, obviously, the, the voters have voted, the, the school uh, and, and, and the city, and we've gone through all the various pieces here. And um, the school is, you know, we're going to, we're building a school there. And so now all of our responsibility is to, is to make it um, the safest possible arrival and dismissal. Um, and uh, we can do that. We will do that. And uh, just also are, you know, continue to look for suggestions and improvements so they can, you know, the best ideas can come from anybody. Um, and so we need to keep on delivering those suggestions in that spirit, I, I hope. Anything else? Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. <laughs> Second. Okay, thank you. Maria, roll call vote. Kathy Clancy. Yes. Mr. Favaza. Yes. Chairman Pope. Yes. Ms. Prince. Yes, good night. Mayor Taken. Yes. Ms. Watson. Yes. And Ms. Wieson. Yes. yes. Okay, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you all. Soon. Good night. Good night, Good night everyone. everyone.